A good Tuesday morning to you, and welcome to Real Talk for those joining us live. A very good morning to you for the thousands upon thousands that will join us later in the day by way of downloading the podcast or swinging by YouTube. We wish that, uh, or we wish a great day to you as well. We've got a ton of emails here this morning uh, following a pretty lively show yesterday, and and, uh, Real Talkers are all kinds of riled up uh, in good ways. Uh, motivated. Uh, some of you are are discouraged. Some of you are telling us that you felt a, a little glum uh, or even hopeless heading into tomorrow's broadcast, and something happened. You you came here and you communed with your fellow real talkers, and 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 you told us about the impact on that in these emails. We can't uh, ignore. Uh, the amount of correspondence that we saw yesterday, which means that uh, producer Sarah Hoyles has has opened up this show. So it's going to breathe a little bit. And I'm excited about that. It gives us an opportunity to give you the floor, which is kind of the whole point of this exercise. It's to get us dialoguing. And uh, you have done that on mass. Our hashtag Real Talk RJ is a great way to keep in touch with us on Twitter uh, throughout the broadcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about some pretty interesting stuff today. Number one, uh, domestic violence. It's a men's issue. That's the assertion that uh, Jackson Cates argues in his TED Talk that about two and a half million people have checked out. Jackson's going to join us alongside Danielle Murdoch from Rowan House. We're going to talk about domestic violence as a men's issue. I know that some men get threatened by this conversation. And uh, potentially, uh, as a matter of fact, as I've just used the word threatened, I don't do this all the time. I almost want to reel that back because I don't mean it disrespectfully. Um, I've, I've been uh, privy to enough conversations, public conversations about domestic violence and, and men and what the statistics say and how we address it to know that some men will get in touch with this show and say, I have been, or I am a victim of domestic violence or a survivor of domestic violence. And quite frankly, I don't appreciate the assertion. And the fact of the matter is that does happen. And men very much can be survivors or victims of domestic violence, absolutely without a doubt. Statistically speaking, overwhelmingly, women and children are the targets of domestic violence. And that's what we'll be talking about today, not to dismiss other perspectives. And as a matter of fact, if you're listening to this broadcast just two minutes in, and you're going, I already have a whole lot to say about this, you know where to find us. Talk at ryanjesperson.com, the hashtag, or on our live chat, although... That's its own animal. We do our best to stay on top of the live chat, but sometimes that takes on a life of its own. We do, we do our best to, to keep a, a keen eye on what real talkers are discussing as the show progresses. Very excited that Tarek Fancy has agreed to join us coming up on the show in about an, an hour and 25 minutes from now. If you're listening live around noon Eastern, 10 o'clock Mountain, former senior executive at the world's biggest asset manager, BlackRock. It was in charge of sustainable investing, but left a couple of years ago. Is now 
essentially suggesting that the so-called green movement, that sustainable investing, may be uh, presented as a little bit more realistic or maybe a little bit more impactful than it actually is. He, he argues that there's actually no free market, that the, the, the market cannot be relied upon itself to regulate in the context of sustainable or green transitions. He says it's ridiculous, as a matter of fact, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. That's coming up again in in just under an hour and a half. We're going to leave some time to talk about uh, some of the things that that we're paying attention to, the stories that are making news. I mean, the National Advisory Council on Immunization, the NACI in Canada yesterday, uh, somewhat of a shocking piece in the National Post. Uh, the, the, the essentially the federal body, the National Advisory Council on Immunization, arguing that people who can wait for an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer or Moderna should should hold out for it. And people are absolutely blowing a gasket over this. Like, what the hell in the time of vaccine hesitancy at a time where getting millions of Canadians and billions of global citizens vaccinated as is the top priority. Why on earth? What would be the motivation to put something like this out there? I've seen some people argue that the NACI should be blown up, should be not literally, should be dismantled, should be canceled, if you will. And I want to have that conversation with you. Maybe talk about drinking in parks today. Our home city of Edmonton, Alberta, voting to allow drinking in some city parks as a pilot. If you're if you're watching or tuning in from from some jurisdictions in Europe or some other places, or even in a place where drinking in parks is technically outlawed, you're going to say, "Well, let me tell you, drinking in parks is actually pretty darn good." Some of you may push back on it. I don't know. I'm curious to see where that conversation goes. Plus, we'll touch on other news. Of the day, including comments made by Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney yesterday. We'll review those in, eh, we'll see, about a half hour's time or so. Heather wrote in to us uh, yesterday, just, just about a half hour after our show wrapped, and she said, I, I just wanted to thank you for Monday's show. It was with great relief that I listened and that I heard that other Albertans are feeling as exhausted as I am with this current pandemic situation. Heather said, prior to tuning into Real Talk on Monday, I felt that there was something wrong with me, that I was maybe the only one who was exhausted from watching the horror show that Alberta has become, that I should be doing a better job of processing and coping with the situation. But the show helped me realize I'm not the only one struggling and that others do feel the same way that I do. And it was very gratifying to learn that I'm not alone and that many of my fellow Albertans are as dismayed as I am. Heather says Real Talk gave me the hope I needed to continue to do my part to stay safe and to keep my fellow Albertans safe while also demanding accountability from our elected officials. She says thanks to Real Talk for being a voice for the majority of Albertans. Heather, I think that's a great email. I appreciate it. Marion comes at us in a little bit of a different spirit today. And who can who can blame Marion? She was in touch with us just about 45 minutes ago. She said, I have so much to say, but I just can't at this moment. My heart's broken and my head hurts. I can't wrap my head around why people are acting the way they are. Just follow the protocols. It's not difficult. That from Marion. Short and sweet. Sat down to write an email to share her thoughts. Says she can barely get the words out. Stephanie chimed in and said, you know, I've I've only caught a few episodes of Real Talk. Really appreciate you live streaming them. Mostly, says Stephanie, after I've become incensed by this government's stupidity or inaction. I don't hope that we see more stupidity, Stephanie, but I would love to see you tune in more frequently. (laughs) <laughs> she says, I wanted to say thank you because every time this show seems to present wisdom that helps me realign to hope and action as opposed to despair and anger. Not that you weren't angry yesterday, Jespo, but you bring the humanity back into the equation. It helps me focus my anger in the right direction. She says, in other words, the show is a good antidote for the speed of rage, which can catch truly anybody off guard. And it's prevalent today. Stephanie says, I blame social media and the lack of uh, critical thinking being taught in schools. When it gets me, I know that I can tune into real talk and listen to validation of my anger, but a tempering and a redirection. I've regained my compassion, yet not lost my desire for action because I have listened to this show. That's a pretty amazing feat. I thought you might want to hear that. That from Stephanie. That's incredible. And how about this one from Christina? Christina wrote in yesterday afternoon, said, I'm probably not going to be as eloquent as some of your other correspondents. She is. She does a great job. 
She says, but I did want to add my voice to the chorus after your show today, even if I'm a bit late. She says, I've never felt my vote counted for much here. Even though I've lived in Alberta most of my life, I'm, I'm not a conservative voter and I never have been. So most places I've lived have, have, you know, I've sort of represented a bit of a smaller minority. I've been embarrassed of Alberta before. I was in Ontario in grad school when Ralph Klein drunkenly threw money at a homeless man. And, and not only did he not resign, but was later reelected. All my colleagues asked me what was so wrong with Alberta. My province has disappointed me. It has broken my heart many times before, but I've never been so ashamed, so devastated, so hopeless, and so angry as I am right now, says Christina. It's humiliating. With the premier and the Bowdoin rodeo clowns as the face of us, it's become obvious that there are cruel and ignorant people, both in government and in the general population. Not only do they not care about others, it, it, it feels sometimes like they're actively trying to hurt us, almost like they're trying to extend the pandemic so nobody's lives can get back to normal again. And it's become increasingly clear to me that for all of the premier's obnoxious talk about lives and livelihoods, he simply doesn't care about either. He could fix this. He's always had the power to do something, a power, in fact, that nobody else has. I simply don't understand why one of the most ambitious politicians in Canada is so completely failing to do the job he signed up for. It's a hard job, no question, says Christina, being premier. But if he didn't want to make tough choices and if he didn't want to have the courage to lead when we so desperately need it, why did he run? And maybe more to the point, he has no right to stay in the job now if he doesn't want to do it. When we desperately need someone with real courage and strength to get us out of this. Christina says, I'm scared for teachers and healthcare workers and all the other frontline workers that feel abandoned by this government and by too many of their fellow citizens. I am angry at people who voted for this government, who put us in this position, even though some of them are my friends and family. I'm frustrated that I see absolutely no way out. I found myself crying says Christina, when you spoke to Rachel Notley on your show on Monday because I was overwhelmed by the conversation in the face of my anger and my humiliation and my sadness. I want so badly to believe her that we should not let the noisy outliers convince us that they are representative of who we are, that Alberta is better than that rodeo this weekend or the mess of our pandemic response. I want us to be our better selves but as someone who's had her heart broken by Alberta before, I don't hold much hope. I'll be incredibly happy to be proven wrong. Best, Christina. Fantastic. Hearts on sleeves. That's what we're seeing in our inbox, and that's just the beginning. We're going to leave more time to get to more of your messages. Sarah's keeping an eye on the live chat. We'll be monitoring the hashtag. Let's officially kick this off. You know that our presenting sponsor each and every morning is Bitcoin Well. They're proudly headquartered out of Edmonton and growing quick. They've quadrupled their staff in the last year. Can you believe it? Moving to a big new location, downtown Edmonton, but you'll find their Bitcoin ATMs across Canada. And if you have questions about crypto, you're trying to make sense of it. Let me be honest right now. If you're talking about crypto with your pals, they're going, what do you think? Bitcoin or Ethereum? Bitcoin or Ethereum? If you want to hear an educated answer to that question, track down the team at Bitcoin Well right now via the sponsors tab right at the top of the page at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Jackson Katz is a a gender violence expert and uh, the author and deliverer of a TED Talk that has seen uh, closing in, uh, frankly, on three million views, about two and a half million views, violence versus women, violence against women. It's a men's issue. Danielle Murdoch is the chairperson of the board for Rowan House and the Safe at Home program. I'm looking forward to a meaningful conversation with these uh, two uh, centering around violence against women. I want to welcome both of you to Real Talk. Thanks for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jackson, uh, I, I've been, a, as mentioned in my preamble, I've been a part of a lot of these conversations about domestic violence, and I know that statistically speaking, nobody here uh, involved in this conversation is going to disagree that women and children are disproportionately targeted 
when it comes to family violence or domestic violence, but I guarantee we're going to hear from men who are sincere in insisting that they too are survivors of domestic violence and the conversation needs to be expanded. When you talk about violence against women as a men's issue, do you have to offer some sort of a a caveat uh, or or, or can you say it with confidence and say, hey, listen, uh, I have the numbers to back up the assertion, no doubt about it. Um, well, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the question, and thanks for involving me in the conversation. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that some men are the victims of uh, domestic violence, whether at the hands of uh, other men or women. Um, but it, but it, it's it's you don't have to say that that doesn't exist to say that the overriding problem in the world is not men as victims of domestic violence. It's men as perpetrators, what, you know, perpetrators of, of, of violence and heterosexual abusive behavior in heterosexual relationships and in, and in same sex relationships. So it's not one or the other, but I would say that I, I, there's a false equivalence to say that somehow, Oh, we have women violating, uh, assaulting men. We have men assaulting women. And therefore to talk about it as a gender issue or as a male dominance issue is, is, you know, is inappropriate or inaccurate. I think we have to push back on that. I don't think that that's accurate. Accurate. I don't think that's, that's that, that, what, whether it's research or data or common sense suggests that this is an equal problem. The overwhelming majority of serious violence in heterosexual relationships is done by men against women. The the the, the violence with intent to harm, the you know injuries, the the controlling behaviors. This this is coming generally speaking in one direction in heterosexual relationships from men to women. And I don't think you can you, that it doesn't mean you have to dismiss that some men are themselves victimized or in the in a subordinate position to say that the larger problem is you know is men assaulting women and by the way not just within domestic excuse me within relationships this is a much broader cultural pattern of men's dominance men's violence against women of which one subset is heterosexual men's controlling and abusive behavior in relationships. I want to get into that as part of our conversation, to be sure. Let, let's put some statistics here as we sort of lay the groundwork uh, for this conversation. Women and girls, uh, when it comes to family violence, uh, national statistics account for two-thirds uh, of all victims of family violence. Uh, these statistics from 2019, more than 100,000 incidents of intimate partner violence reported in Canada in 2019, women accounting for almost 80%. Uh, When it comes to the survivors or the victims in all of these incidents, Daniel, let let me actually I kind of trip myself up there in reading these statistics. Let me ask you, victim or survivor, what's your preferred vernacular and why? We like to refer to it as survivor uh, rather than victim so that we're not re-victimizing the survivor when we talk about it. Uh, We like to refer to them as survivors for that very reason. So what's I mean, when it when it comes to the conversation that we have these days, you know, we're going to be talking to an an investment expert later on in the show. We talk to public health experts. We talk to psychologists. We'll talk to people here involved in in domestic violence intervention and supports. Uh, Everything, it seems, uh, you know, runs parallel to the storyline of this pandemic and to COVID-19. You can't really have a conversation about anything these days without acknowledging the impact that this pandemic has had. Uh, Does that fit in this conversation? What are you seeing? We did see a significant difference in the number of women we had coming into shelter during the pandemic. We actually had to reduce our capacity uh, in the shelter from our full 24 bed capacity down to uh, four beds because we had to have a designated washroom for each uh, room. So it definitely did have an impact. I will say, however, that we did have an increase in the um, outreach services and women calling into the shelter for information and direct um, access to our outreach services. We did start to see an increase in, uh, once again, into the uh, demand for our outreach services just this March as service as um, the pandemic sort of started to slow again. And now we've started to see an uptick in the, the pandemic again. So um, we are seeing continued access to the shelter and uh, the outreach services again, uh, continuing to be busy. Um, I think the pandemic itself had um, a detrimental effect to women being able to actually get into the shelter, whether that's the fact that men were more present in the home in a lot of cases, and they didn't have the capability to actually reach out 
or get away from the abuser um, in a way that they felt safe in reaching out to uh, services. For instance, if, if the man is working outside of the home, they might have the ability to reach out um, on a more confidential basis. But if you're together 24 seven, you maybe don't have that opportunity. And that was part of the reason we saw uh, less access into the shelter. Jackson, uh, before we get into the premise of your TED talk, of your argument, what your expertise tells you, uh, how does COVID-19 factor into some of the observations that you've been making? Well, I mean, I think it's true that people are home more and therefore engaged more directly with each other in a way that creates the possibility, at least, for um, more tension and more, you know, and more, um, and as a result, more potential for violence. I mean, I think when it comes to domestic violence, I mean, in in the sexual violence area, I mean, it's, some of this is complicated and I can't say that I have my, you know, on the tip of my tongue, all the data that's going to emerge in the coming years when there's going to be all kinds of research done about this. But a lot of it's moved online, for example, there's a lot of abusive behavior that takes place in the virtual spaces not just in the physical spaces because people are home and they're connected virtually and through, um, through social media. So, so that's, that's especially true in sort of cyber stalking, cyber uh, bullying and other forms of image based abuse that it seems that there's an uptick in that kind of behavior because of the um, because of the virtual um, universe that people are now in, inhabiting even more so because they can't be as mobile in the out in the world but i would say i would say that the, the pandemic didn't cause any of these problems it just exacerbated in certain as certain aspects of the problem it exacerbated it um and like so many other you know social phenomena it's complicated but the problem pre- obviously preceded and predated the pandemic by centuries so it's not like it's a it's a new phenomenon it's just there's some there's a twist because of COVID that we have to encounter, we, that we have to account for in, in the way that we understand, you know, uh, what's going on. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we talk about millennia or, or, or centuries of, of recorded human history and we can make observations and I, and I'm sure you could probably take us through it. Um, our understanding maybe of, of some of these trends or some of these, uh, do I say biological or genetic realities have, have prompted conversations or more awareness around things like, toxic masculinity or rape culture or some of the things that that people who sincerely desire to learn more about this and and to impact change have been educating themselves on but what do we need to understand as 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 kind of the foundation for this conversation on this being a men's issue because i suspect at the end of this conversation the call to action will be aimed for the most part at men right so where do we need to start our conversation here well I think women have been at the forefront, women all over the world in a multiracial, multi-ethnic sense for decades and and centuries really, but certainly for the past half century, women have been at the forefront of pushing for uh, you know, services for victims and survivors, changing the laws to make uh, hold offenders accountable, to to create prevention programming. Women have been at the forefront of all of these transformative changes and they will continue to be so. There's always been a number of men who have been involved in supportive roles and in, you know, as allies and, you know, and there's, there have been some powerful and, 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 and great men involved in this work, but only a tiny number when you consider the, the, the scope of the problem. And I, so when I say, you know, violence against women is a men's issue, there's many dimensions to it, but the heart of it is men are the ones who are committing the vast majority of the abuse, harassment, and violence against women and children, against other men as well, against themselves. I mean, it's all connected, but men have been the ones committing the vast majority of the abuse. Men also hold the majority and the vast majority in many cases of social, economic, and political power in the world and institutional leadership and and so to say that it's a women's issue, to call, for example, domestic and sexual violence women's issues, in my opinion, what it does is it shifts accountability off of men and puts it onto women. It says it's women's concern. It's women's issue. Women have to deal with this. Women have to clean up after the fact. Women have to take care of themselves. And yet that's one of the ways that power, in this sense, is is um, sort of avoiding or evading uh, accountability and responsibility. And I think, by the way, calling, for example, domestic and sexual violence women's issues is a subtle form of victim blaming, because it's basically saying it's them that's doing it in some way. They're putting themselves in these situations. 
I don't think that individual people, whether they're men, women, or others, who say that you know they think domestic violence is a women's issue, I don't think that they're conscious that they're, what they're trying, what they're doing, is shifting accountability off of the group with more power onto the group with less. But I think that's in fact what they're doing. And so I think the role that some of us need to play, I think, especially men, is we need to make visible what has been rendered invisible in the discourse or in the conversation. And what one of the things that's been rendered invisible is men and accountability for men. And, what, and by the way, Ryan, let me just say, I don't think this is biological or genetic. I think that male children are born as every bit as loving and compassionate as, as, as female children, all right? I think what happens is the culture imposes certain a set of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that are associated with this notion of quote unquote gender and masculinity. And it's always changing, by the way. Cultural definitions of masculinity and masculinities are always changing. There, it's a dynamic process. There's differences all over the world and different cultures have their different definitions. I think what we have to do in, say, North America, where we have this enormous problem, it's a global problem, but enormous problem of domestic and sexual violence and sexual harassment that men engage in against women, we have to figure out what are we, how are we teaching our sons to be men? Why, why is generation after generation these problems surfacing? Why, wh how are we teaching boys and men to deal with relationships, to deal with notions of entitlement, whether it's sexual entitlement or emotional um, centrality in a relationship? Or why do we teach boys and men that their needs should be met first or that women are there to serve their needs? And if men, women aren't serving those needs, then force or the threat of force is a legitimate way to get what you think is you know, yours or to that, that you know you deserve. How are we teaching boys and men all of this? And not just, by the way, within families. That's a myth. It's not just that it's being transmitted within a family from generation to generation. I mean, there's some of that, but it's also the entire culture, the media culture, the porn culture, the, the peer culture, the sports culture, all the different values and ways in which a society transmits its values. How are is our society implicated in this ongoing pan, you know, problem of men's violence against women, not just individual pathological perpetrators. We, we can't just be running from one man to the next and saying, what went wrong with him? Why did he do this? Did he have a drinking problem? Did he lose his job? Did he have some issues, mental health issues? I mean, this is what ends up happening. People run from one individual to the next as if it's an individual problem when we really have to look at the underlying attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in the whole society and ask, what are we doing wrong that we're, this is a problem generation after generation? Yeah, I, I don't want to take us off track, but as you're talking and as you're describing this and you're talking about the culture and where we see it, uh, again, I don't want to drag us off track, but I just think even yesterday provided some commentary about a maskless mass gathering, a rodeo, an end the lockdown rodeo that's, that's, that's pissed off about 4 million people here in Alberta, and I think probably millions more across Canada. And it's been interesting, some proponents uh, from the rodeo, uh, supporters of the rodeo, some attendees of the rodeo have been in touch with us suggesting that, that I should state a time and place where I, can, where I can fight one of the guys. He wants to come fight me, and they're calling me, they're calling me a soy boy, and they want to see how the soy boy can stand up uh, if, he, if, you know, if I'm going to say this face-to-face -to, -face to these people, and I'm such a pussy because I'm going to get smacked down and beaten and bitch slapped. And it's really actually, I mean, it's, it, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic and if it wasn't so embarrassing, quite frankly. And that was a better part of my afternoon yesterday, hearing from these clowns. So I'm not, I'm not directing attention away from where it needs to be, Jackson, but we see evidence of it everywhere. Oh, my God, Ryan, that's, ex that's what your point, you just made a beautiful point. I mean, this is, this is about gender. It's about masculinity. It's about uh, what does it mean to be strong? I mean, I, I think some of those men and women and others are still invested in this really archaic and I think discredited <laughs> notion of strength, especially strength for men, that somehow strength resides in your ability to impose your will against others, whether it's in a relational context or, or elsewhere. And I think we need to expand our definition of what it means to be strong as a man, you know, caring and compassion and moral courage and social courage and speaking up and speaking truth to power and calling out bullies. That's a, these are all examples of strength and, 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 and resilience and courage that, that, that don't involve violence and abuse. But when, when your go-to as a man is power and, and manhood resides in physical force and your ability to impose your will, that's one of the reasons why we have a problem of domestic violence. With this, I mean, this is one of the problems we, we have sexual violence. So many men are invested and, and the culture is teaching so many boys and men that manhood means 
you're in control. You're in control of yourself. You're in control of others. And if you if you need to use force or the threat of force to gain something to 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 be to establish yourself or to maintain your power and control, then then that's just how it is. That's what we're fighting against. So your point is not taking us down a different direction. It's actually directly um, uh, related. Danielle, I, w- I want to yeah. get into the this. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Uh, would you like to add something to that before I get into my question? Please do. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say that violence against women isn't caused by women and it won't be stopped by focusing on what women can do to change their lives. Yeah. And this is why what we do is focus on education as part of uh, educating about domestic abuse. We go right down into elementary schools and we start talking to kids about bullying and how you can change uh, what bullying is, what friendship is, what kindness is. We talk to grade twos, grade fives, grade eights. We talk. We go into high schools and we talk about healthy relationships education is a key component about changing the dynamics of domestic abuse you got to start young with these kids and and educate them about this type of behavior is not appropriate because uh, jackson is 100 percent right this is about a cultural phenomenon i wonder if uh ways Dan- to uh, behave in a certain way Sorry, Dan, we, we lost you for a quick second there, but but I think we have you back. I froze uh, up there. Yeah, but just yeah. just for a quick second. So it's all good. Um, let's let's get into this. Um, let me let, let me for a second state, you know, when, when we have conversations like this and I know that thousands of people are going to hear it. And, and my fear is that we preach to the choir on one side where right? we preach to the converted who are going to agree with everything we say and 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 we'll we'll better educate people on the programs we're going to talk about the safe at home program which is remarkable this four year pilot it's awesome but for the most part these aren't the people that need to hear the message and then and then the other people that do need to hear the message i mean number one they're going to be rattled that i'm wearing a, a salmon colored shirt for starters um but when we start talking about going into schools and talking to little boys i've seen thousands of these comments over the years about you know teaching these boys you know where you know you know exactly where i'm going right you know if i could use crude words to describe i could i could talk about the feedback we'll get but people are going to be nervous that our young men are going to be losing what we've developed over millennia for the father to be the protector of the man of the house the patriarch and basically, to be crude for a second they're going to say we're, we're raising a bunch of pussies that's what we're doing and they're going to dismiss The entire conversation. And I often wonder, is this interview going to land with a thud because people over here agree and these people won't even give us their time? So, Danielle, so how do we approach it? How do we grab people's attention? I mean, what are we talking to kids about in elementary schools that everybody needs to know? Well, in, in elementary school, we, we basically start with them and say, this is what kindness is. Uh, We start with that. This is what kindness is about. This is what friendship is. This is what uh, bullying behavior looks like. And this is how bullying behavior makes you feel. Um, This doesn't feel good to you. This is why you shouldn't do this with somebody else. And if we start with those fundamental pieces, then kids realize that, okay, if it makes me feel this way, then maybe I shouldn't be doing this to somebody else. And if you start with, Uh, trying to instill that sense of empathy with them at a young age, they can grow into um, developing with that sense of empathy and hopefully learning that if I do, if it makes me feel this way, then I shouldn't be uh, implementing this type of behavior on somebody else and making them feel that way. And that's the whole premise of this type of education. Um, you know, and, and we can always try, we can try what they get at home is sometimes very, very different than what we educate in school. So, you know, we can't expect it to work miracles, but it's a start. Yeah. That's a great point on our live chat right now. Jillian says in politics, sports, entertainment, business, we always see that a man's accomplishments will always trump bad behavior. I don't know if that's a play on words or not. She says men are taught young that their achievements matter more than their behavior. She goes on to say things are getting better, but people are still too happy to elect, watch movies featuring, buy music from, and cheer on abusive men. And when a guy is exposed and boycotted, it's then called cancel culture. What do you think, Jackson? Sounds pretty bang on to me. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the the, 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 the caller, uh, you know, is it's just, 
um, evidencing a, a sensibility that that we have a long way to go. I mean, I mean, in terms of gender justice and gender equality, and and living up to the values that we say we profess, which is democracy and, and equality and fairness and and justice. That's what all, that's what we're talking about here, by the way. I mean, it's, it's not something radical. It's just like how, how are we gonna how are we gonna have healthy relationships where we don't we we're not training boys and men that they're supposed to be in control of women. And, and or in the society at large, if we say we believe in fairness and democracy, how can we justify, you know, men's, you know, control over resources and power and political and social and economic, uh, you know, uh, resources and power? I mean, it's pretty basic. And by the way, back to your point, Ryan, about the, um, the pushback, I appreciate it. I know, you, you know, because you because in the position you're in and the kind of feedback that you get. And the same with me. I mean, I know where the where the potential points of. Um, either conflict or pushback are going to be. And that's why I think this whole point about strength has got to be re-emphasized. This is well, I'm not saying I'm not saying that we we don't we want boys or men not to be strong. I want to be strong as a man. I want my son to be strong. The question is how you define strength. And is it is it adaptive in the 21st century for men to continue to hold and cling to this dated and I think, again, discredited notion of what it means to be a man that's based in a, a cartoon from previous eras, or are we going to grow and evolve into the 21st century? We live in racially and ethnically diverse societies. We live in gender and sexually diverse societies. Women aren't going back into the into this, you know, second class status. Women are going forward. The question is whether men are going to have the guts to join them in that process, or are they going to sort of try to, you know, hold their finger in the dike to try to hold back the tides of history. I mean, it's that basic. And, and by the way, I know that there are plenty of people, including in Canada, but certainly in my country, in the U.S., who, who do want to hold back the tides of history. 75 million or 74 million people voted for Donald Trump in uh, 2020. There's, there's an awful lot of people who, who are resisting the changes that are happening, but there's others who are embracing it. And, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, for example, Joe Biden, who who hardly seems like a radical is actually is actually doing stuff that's pushing the, the the ball forward to use a sports metaphor in a in a profound way right and he's an older white man who is smart enough to know that the the tides of history are moving and if you want to be a leader and you want to really get with you know addressing the real needs of people in the 21st century you have to support women and fe you know feminist change is happening period end of sentence are you going to get on board or are you going to try to resist it ethnic and racial diversity is a fact it's not like it's not a theory it's like are you going to get on board or are you going to try to cling to some you know really really you know, old vision of what you think is the world should be. I, I, so I think part of what we need to say to men is, are you going to adapt and evolutionarily adapt to the changes or are you going to be, be one of those people who tries to, tries to resist those changes. And I, I think by framing it positively, you can say we need more men with the courage and strength to challenge some of these old and abusive behaviors. Not, not, we're not talking about weakness. We're talking about strength. I don't think that a man who physically abuses his wife is a strong man. I don't think a, a man who needs to uh, bully others or a person who needs to bully others to, to make themselves feel good is somehow evidencing strength. I think it's a, that's a caricature of strength. Mm. So, so I would push back on this whole notion that what we're trying to do is undermine strength. And by the way, kindness is just strength, especially for a boy or a man who lives in a culture that still teaches him that being a man means being powerful and, and ex, you know exerting his will. Teaching him kindness is actually a challenging thing because that's countercultural to that teaching that that manhood is you know power. So I think part of the reason, by the way, some of this is so difficult. To, it's so difficult to deal with domestic and sexual violence because it does. It's not about it, like specific behaviors by pathological individuals. It's about the social changes around these whole notions of of you know, what it means to be a man or a woman in a, in a changing environment. And it's about identity as much as it is about um, you know, uh, you know, specific sort of behaviors. So none of us should be naive. And I think in the field, and Danielle knows this, I know this, in the field of domestic and sexual violence, we know that what we're doing is long-term work to change kind of social norms that we can we can run and we can help for survivors, victims, and survivors. We can punish offenders, but over time.
time, the way that things are going to change is through changing these underlying norms. And that means educating our kids differently. It means being critical of what of what we all are consuming in terms of uh, media and it, in, in terms of what we're ex- accepting and what we're not accepting. And, and over time, when you make those changes, and by the way, one of the roles that men can play in this is that men who are not abusive need to start speaking up and challenging other men who are. We need to, men need to interrupt each other's sexist comments, not just physically abusive behaviors, but when you're a guy and you're hanging out with a group of guys and one of your guy friends makes a really disparaging comment about women, if you don't say something to make it clear that that's not cool with you, in a sense, your silence is a form of consent and complicity in his sexism or his misogyny. And, and we can't be naive. Part of the way that that abusive behavior, I mean, part of one of the streams that feeds the river of abusive behavior is these little comments, these little attitudes and uh, behaviors that might not themselves be uh, criminal, but they they contribute to this idea that men are, should be in charge, men should be entitled to women's bodies, men, it's okay to violate women's space, it's okay to yell out at a woman running down the street, you know, make a sexualized comment to a woman that you're walking by in the street, these are all little you know, minor, if you will, they might not be felt as minor, but they might be minor aggressions, but they're, they're violations that when you think about all the, the sum total of them lead up to the problems that we have of, you know, of, I often use the pyramid. The tip of the pyramid is an incident of a domestic violence or sexual assault. That's the tip of the pyramid. But the base of the pyramid is, is attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that normalize the kind of power relationships that end up in abusive acts at the tip of the pyramid. So if you're a man and you yourself, maybe maybe you don't see a sexual assault taking place in front of you or domestic violence incident, but you do see and hear and participate in commentary and sort of the, the formation of attitudes. If you don't interrupt those attitudes, then in a sense, you're helping to perpetuate the culture that produces that abusive act at the tip of the pyramid. This is, uh, I think, a perfect uh, opportunity to to get into what what's going on at Rowan House, this safe at home program. Uh, Danielle, this is so I understand it correctly. This is out of Claris Home, Alberta, as a matter of fact, um, a four year pilot. You're about halfway in. Is that correct? And, and, and my understanding is it, it's it's a bit of a unique model in that those that are uh, sort of wrapping their minds around or perceiving a, a, a so-called shelter or, 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 or understanding uh, which gender or which individual statistically or typically is displaced, in other words, leaves the home. We, we need only look at our vernacular, right? She fled domestic violence, not he fled after perpetrating abuse or perpetrating violence, right? It's, it's always her. It's always her that's had to, to, to hide some cash away. It's always her that had to get the kids packed up without him knowing. It's always her that had to leave in the dead of night or when he was playing golf or whatever the case may be, right? And, and, and safe at home is, is the exact opposite. Can you take us into it? Right. So as you said, uh, it's a four-year pilot project, and it's funded by the federal government, Department of Wage and Gender Equality. And what we're uh, trying to do is build a blueprint for something different, uh, an innovative approach to domestic abuse. It's designed to help the participants become accountable for their actions, but also be supportive and understanding and developing healthier behaviors. And what we're trying to do is remove the abuser from the family home and place them in a transitional housing facility where they're provided with psychoeducation, group therapy, and other supports to help them plan for a future free from domestic abuse. And so while they're in the program, we also provide the women and children who are safe at home in their stable environment, and they receive outreach supports from Rowan House and other community partners as required. So what have you, what have you seen two years into the pilot that, that you would say might indicate that this could be a model uh, that could be applied, let's say, across the country into the United States, where we're talking to Jackson from or around the world. I mean, are there some things where you're going, whoa? So even though we're two years into the project, uh, we just opened our doors in March. Mm. Uh, the first two years were planning, program development, uh, writing of the program. So since we opened in March, we've had six applicants. Um, uh, of the six applicants, we currently have one gentleman in the program, uh, one under consideration. Um, the other applicants we weren't able to take into the program for various reasons. Um, the one gentleman in the program is doing very well. Um, so 
it's certainly been eye-opening for sure. And we're super excited going forward. Um, we have also uh, what we call the Healthy Relationships Group for Men. We have five participants in that, and that is a weekly support group with an online base. Uh, we have five participants in that. Um, that is going exceptionally well. That is funded by the RCMP. We received a grant for them, so that's actually not uh, uh, it's part of Safe at Home, but it wasn't funded in the same way. Um, so that is going uh, extremely well. We're um, learning something new every day with this program, but um, it's it's certainly eye-opening. And we're finding that we are looking at the point now where we're going to expand the participation because previously we were only taking men that would self-refer into the program, meaning that they would have to sign up themselves. Uh, we weren't taking any mandated clients, but right now we are looking at taking mandated clients that would be perhaps referred by the court system or uh, maybe have involvement with the RCMP, provided that they are on the lower risk spectrum. And we will take them, but they have to be willing participants. They have to say, yes, I'm willing to change. I want to do this. Because if they aren't willing and they don't want to do it, the program isn't going to be successful for them. Jackson, what intrigues you about this model? Everything. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's incredibly interesting. I mean, it's it, you know, domestic violence is the one crime where the um, where the where the victim or the survivor has to uh, typically leave the house, yeah. and the and the and the and the perpetrator not. And so, you know, uh, you know, people, friends of my a friend of mine, Diane Rosenfeld at Harvard Law School, has been writing about this for you know thirty years about the uh, reframing our understanding of how the law deals with offenders and taking them out of the house. I mean, I know that there's many complicating factors. Safety is, is first and foremost uh, an issue. I mean, this, the safety of, of, the, of the women and children has to be for, you know, in the foreground of any sort of policy. And so therefore, if a man is dangerous, unless he's in a, a secure facility, then it's, it doesn't, it's not gonna work. So, so I appreciate that, that there, are, there are some limitations as Danielle um, you know, uh, identified, but I think the conceptually, the idea of the the person who's committing the acts of abuse is the one who needs to be separated from the, his targets um, makes a whole lot of sense. How, operationally, how to do that is what they're trying to ex explore, and I, I support that. I think we need to be creative. I think I think I think the status quo. I mean, I'm making a general statement, not about Roland House, but the status quo of how we've been dealing with effect, uh, the domestic uh, violence. Uh, that you know isn't particularly effective to be honest with you and and there's all kinds of problems in the system i mean we we know a lot more than we know 50 years ago i mean there's been a lot of growth in the in the movement in the battered women's movement and the in the batter intervention movement in other words court mandated programs and and the the the, the approach that they take and but there's not consistency there's not uniformity of 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 programmatic approaches there's there, there the requirements differ from province to province or it's certainly in the united states from state to state so i think we have a long way to go but we do know a lot we we know the, the, i think the biggest problem that we've had and, and i'm making a wildly general statement um is not that we don't know or have insight into what's going on in domestic violence relationships or in you know or even sexual assault um, it's 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 the political will to to make the changes and hold systems accountable for addressing things, whether that's resource allocation and funding, whether it's training requirements, whether it's legal definitions and legal sort of strictures. I think the politics are the more difficult uh, piece of the work, rather than the pedagogy or the the, the education or the or the training. I, I think I think, for example, in, it, I work with systems, whether it's military systems, school systems, you know, university systems. This, this is about leadership and it's about the failures of leadership and failures of cultural, political and institutional leadership more than it is the failures of people on the ground level, the, the, the domestic and sexual violence advocates and workers and educators who know a ton about this subject matter. They know a ton about the dynamics. What what we have to do is figure out how to hold leadership accountable in the society at large for addressing these issues in policy and in practice in a much more systematic way. And by the way, getting back to the original point that you asked me about or related to the original point, uh, Ryan, that you asked me about, about men and men's issue, there's an awful lot of men, good men, who are in positions of institutional leadership, cultural influence, 
um, in the sports culture, in the the political culture in the in the business world in the union world in the in in you know education obviously in religion you know there's so many men who are in positions of influence who are good people who don't say or do anything about these issues they 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 they're ham you know strung if you will they're they're tongue tied they don't say anything they don't do anything they might be good people but we need more from men than just being good people and i think a lot of men will say well because i don't abuse women it's not really my issue mm. And, 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 and I think that's so ridiculous on so many levels. It's like saying racism is not my problem because I'm a white person and I don't burn crosses and I don't, you know, paint swastikas on people's, you know, fences or something. And therefore, racism is not my issue. But people it's do a, say that. People do think that? that. People do say right, that. But that's an impoverished understanding of racism as, as, as is an impoverished understanding of sexism is that because I don't personally beat my wife or sexually harass women, these aren't my issues. And I've, part of the, the, the basic education here has to be, we all have a role to play in societies. Those of us who have leadership roles have a greater role to play. And women's leadership has been exemplary on these issues. Men's, not so much. And we need to change that. And that has to be, by the way, generational. Some of it has to be generational because my generation, as we get older, you know, some of us can be influential. I'm not saying that we can't, but we have to really impart to the next generation, your generation and younger men, this idea that this is not optional. We're not asking you to be, you know, you know, opting into some new fangled way of being a man. This is like, this is what you need to do to be a responsible citizen, Canadian citizen or American citizen in the 21st century. And if you're not stepping up to this, then, then you're missing the moment. I think, I think it's that big a deal. And one takeaway, certainly for, from my from my piece of this conversation, is that we need more men who are willing to take some risks, and we need to take some. You know, it's not that big a risk, but it's a risk. You need to stand up and speak out and say to other men, "Look, guys, we need to really address this stuff. These women are telling the truth." And and by the way, women in the battered women's movement and the sexual assault movements have been pointing us in a direction of healthier relationships, healthier families which helps both women and men. And there's an awful lot of boys and men who are trauma survivors who are walking wounded as we speak in your province and everywhere else who, who grew up in families where they were abused by their fathers, where their, their father abused their mother or their other men abused their mother and some and the kids and the kids were traumatized. There's an awful lot of boys and men who aren't doing very well in life in part because they grew up in a culture where this sort of really sort of limited and abusive kind of masculinity was normative in their experience. And the women in the domestic and sexual violence movement have been allies of those men and boys from the beginning. And so the, the idea that somehow that they're, they're anti-male because they're calling out adult men's abusive behavior is total BS. And I think we need to move beyond, you know, beyond those simple characters, those simplistic and, and inaccurate caricatures. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes we'll have a conversation and, and in real time uh, we'll see case studies. You know, there's a, there's a fellow using the name Mitch, uh, that showed up on our live chat and, and, and that figures that in the midst of a conversation around domestic violence is a good time to start taking swipes at my character and calling me a tool. And I mean, it just goes to show, like, I, I actually feel sad for Mitch. I, I think that if you're the type of person that that will enter a, a, a live community event like this broadcast, a conversation on domestic violence and start taking swipes at the hope at the host or at the guests. I mean, Mitch has something going on. I don't know who he is, but. Mitch has something going on or he wouldn't be doing this. And whether that's some sort of a sense of insufficiency, uh, whether his dad didn't hug him enough, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, Mitch is damaged. And, uh, and and I'm confident enough to not allow that type of thing to bother me. Uh, but I feel for a guy like Mitch and I feel for a lot of people online that conduct themselves the way that they do. And then in real life as well. Uh, when it all comes down to it, what we endeavor to do is provide a call to action uh, Danelle, to give people, by the way, let me apologize for like mispronouncing your name for the first 40 minutes of our conversation. I'm mortified. Uh, but Danelle, you know, we, we want to call to action. We want to give our audience members something to think about today because they do. They're an engaged audience and, and, and to make an impact in our own communities. I think Jackson's laid it out pretty clearly. When it comes to tee box talk and locker room talk and, and look at me even using the stereotypes that all we do is play hockey and golf. But you get the idea. Danelle, what's your call to action? What's the one thing you want us to walk with, most especially the men? I think the important thing, as Jackson pointed out, is if you see something, you need to say something because to sit there and not 
uh, say something when there's inappropriate behavior or inappropriate talk makes you complicit. Um, if your buddies are making inappropriate comments or, um, you know, inappropriate uh, gestures or whatever towards women, it's not okay. And you need to step up and you need to say something because you don't want to normalize that behavior or make it okay. Um, you can't just be a bystander. We need to make sure that people know that this behavior is not acceptable. Uh, it's not okay anymore. Culture is changing and behavior is changing and we need to shift how things look and that behavior is um, not, that it's not normal behavior anymore, that it's not acceptable. Well, we have you here, Jackson, and, and before we thank both of you for your time, I mean, you're a, you're a, a renowned gender violence expert. Um, as a society, I think we're, we're still learning, but we're learning more about things like gender fluidity, and we're understanding more about uh, what life looks like, walking a mile in, in, in the shoes of a, of a trans woman or a trans man or somebody that, that, is, that is wrapping their mind around. I mean, the, the whole idea of gender as a construct. I mean, this is where these conversations are going. And I think the majority of us, I would say the majority of people lack an understanding, a meaningful understanding, myself included, but there's a desire to understand. You're a gender violence expert. How does this premise fit into the conversation that we're having today? Well, I appreciate that you're saying that you're, you know, you're on a, we're all on a journey. We're all trying to figure this out. We're, we're human beings trying to figure out how to be, you know, healthier and better and create societies and, and structures within those societies, including family structures that are more responsive to the needs of people and, and not reproducing some of the old mistakes of our, of our species. I mean, and we have a big brain, you know, homo sapiens, you know, we're, you know, nature has endowed us with this big brain and we have a, we have complex reasoning skills and we can, we can try to figure out, I mean, we can do so many things so well, you know, science, the scientific sort of uh, discoveries and, and advances of the past, even the past century, it's just incredible. I mean, the internet, the fact that we're having a conversation here, you know, across, we could be all over the world. We could be on, you know, six, seven continents at the same time talking to each other. It's just incredible what we as humans can, can accomplish with our brain. Well, I think one of the things we can accomplish is figuring out how to get along with each other, how to treat each other with respect and dignity, how to define relationships in ways that aren't, you know, hierarchical and, and, um, and, you know, dominance and submissive in, in, in every, in, you know, in every arena of life. It's not, and so gender is one of those categories that is, is like, it's like, it's, by the way, it's, it is always changing. I, I, one example, I mean, there's so many examples, but one example I often use is, um, uh, you know, high heels. People say, well, high heels, that's a women's thing. Women's, women, women wear high heels. But high heels was a, was a, an aristocratic affectation of wealthy white men in Europe in the like 16th and 17th centuries. But now it's seen as a women's thing. Pink used to be a men's color until the 19th century, right? And that, so the idea that somehow gender is is fixed, that it's always been this way and so it always has to be this way, is itself an ignorant point of view. And so I think your your opening point in this in this last piece of the conversation that you know you're open to listening and hearing and learning. I think that's the most important thing. I think that men need to be open to listening and hearing from women. I think and, and each other. I think white people need to listen and hear from people of color about their experiences of the world and how and how their experiences of the world are often very different and often very, um, you know, sort of um, uh, the, the, the discrimination and abuse that they that they face for being people of color in a in a racist society is very different. Does that mean that? Every white person or every man or every heterosexual person is going to either agree with everything they hear or be comfortable with what they're hearing. No, it doesn't mean that. It means having the courage to listen anyways and to think about what you're hearing and think about how you can maybe change your some of your behavior or some of those attitudes that lead to those outcomes. And last, the last point, I think, there's a big difference between guilt and responsibility. And I'll say this because I know that you'll you probably, Ryan, have heard this, and I think we all have heard at some point the idea that somehow talking about this subject matter in the way that I am or Danelle is, is somehow making, trying to make men feel guilty or trying to make white people feel guilty. Or this is somehow just a guilt trip against, you know, people with certain kinds of social advantages. 
I don't, I don't buy that. Okay. I don't feel guilty for being a man. I don't feel guilty for being a white person. I don't feel guilty for being heterosexual. That's silly. I'm, I was born who I am. I am, I feel responsible as a white person in a racist society and world to work towards racial justice, or I'm a hypocrite. I feel responsible as a man to work against sexism and misogyny and men's violence against women. Because if I don't, and I don't work towards that, then in a sense, I'm not living up to my own aspirations for who I think I am, which is I believe in justice and fairness and equality and nonviolence. And if I don't speak up and, and advance those, then I'm in conflict with my own sense of myself. It's not about guilt, it's about responsibility. And I think that's an important distinction because I don't think guilt motivates. I think guilt makes people feel defensive and hunker down, but I think responsibility motivates and it, or has the potential to motivate. And I think an, an awful lot, of, by the way, there's an awful lot of good men who are responsible in their way that they conduct their lives. I think we need to step up our expectation of those men in terms of what they're willing to do. And, and I do think that there's an awful lot of men, including in your, it, I don't think it's just preaching to the converted. I think there's an awful lot of good men who, who, who need a push, if you will. Yeah. They need ideas, they need support, and they need a push both from women, but from other men. And I think if we have, if we do that, if we do that over time, I think we're going to see the social norms change. And it won't be as unusual to hear men having this kind of conversation or saying the things that I've been saying. You know, in fact, maybe 50 years from now, they'll look back at these kind of Zoom calls and say, wow, that was, back then that was radical to hear a man say these things, but now it's just completely understood that that's just completely obvious. And, and, and I think that's how, you know, how historical change happens. I've, I've seen change in my own friend groups. I've seen change in society in, in my 44 years on the planet. So have the both of you, I'm sure. So have the majority of our audience members. I think I've gone on the record before to say full disclosure that I, I've said things as a, as an ignorant, naive teen and young man that I'm appalled by things that I would take back as in a number of different contexts, misogynistic right. comments, racist comments, just absolute ignorance, never out of a sense of real malice, but out of a, a, an absolute, absolutely unaware of the impact that comments were having, absolutely unaware of the root of the comments, absolutely unaware of the severity, the potential damaging, uh, I mean, I just, I, I could go on for an hour. Uh, with introspection, and I hope that everybody does. The point I'm trying to make is I've seen change. I've seen what what's acceptable even in conversations in my own friend groups, in my own tea times, in in, in my own times skating with the boys or, or or sitting at the bar or whatever. And I know that change can happen, but it requires courage and it requires leadership and decency and compassion and all of the things we're talking about, Danelle, all the things that you're talking about teaching in elementary schools or reiterating maybe in elementary schools. I'm so grateful that the two of you have hung out with us this morning. I know this is going to reach a lot of people. Um, if people want to learn more about what's going on with the stay at home program at Rowan house, just check out rowanhouse.ca. hope just a call or text away rowanhouse.ca. Danelle Murdoch is the chairperson of the board there at Rowan house, Jackson Katz, a gender violence expert. You can watch his TED Talk, Violence Against Women. It's a men's issue. Thank you to the both of you for this. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for having me. I want to take a look at the live chat. Um, I, I mean, this is just the conversation. I'm not surprised that this conversation is happening on our live chat, but it's, I mean, it's, it's introspective and courageous and all of those words, and I'm so grateful for it. You know, Erica has been talking about her own family dynamic, how they attempt to raise their son. <laughs> Full disclosure, Erica, the chat just reset and I lost your comment, but it put me right in front of another one of yours. So I get to read that one. Isn't that funny? That's the universe. Maybe the universe likes this one better. Uh, Erica says vastly more men are abusive toward women than the other way around. It's a fact. Imagine being such an insecure man that you're triggered by a simple, obvious fact. Penny touches on something. Penny, I'm so glad I saw you. I'm going to look into the camera, Penny. I want to talk to you personally. Penny sent me an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com a while ago, and I printed it because I wanted to walk with it, literally. In fact, uh, I didn't know if I'd read it on the show because I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to say about it. But Penny actually, and, 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 and it was one of those kind of funny emails where she was, she was being a little bit, I mean, she was being humorous, but, but it, what, what she was implying was really serious. And, and, and she says, 
Now on the live chat, and Penny says, so I know it's the same. I mean, unless it's a, a, a wonderful coincidence, Penny on the live chat says, for example, I can't watch trash talk. And Penny emailed me a couple of weeks ago, and, and I don't have it right in front of me, but essentially it said, Ryan, the, the voice, you know, I know it's meant for entertaining purposes. I know it's the whole idea, blowing off steam, reading people's angry emails. She said, but, but the tone of your voice triggers me. She says, it takes me back. It takes me back to the to the voice of an uh, an abusive man, the voice of a uh, that kind of assertive, angry, gravelly, grumbly delivery. And I don't have any profound comment to offer except for that I appreciate you putting that on my radar. I mean, you know, it's kind of my monster truck arena voice. But when you shared that with me, Penny, it gave me pause to think. And I really appreciate that. We recognize that for, for people, the word trigger, I mean, there, there are so many words that have been weaponized against people. You know, oh, 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 she's triggered. Oh, he's triggered. That is a thing. And everybody's triggered. Right. I mean, you, you talk about the people that are mocking you for being triggered. They are triggered by your comment. I mean, like I talked about these walking case studies, these walking examples you know, the, the fella Mitch that drops in on our live chat, to, you know, to start taking big swipes at me in the middle of a domestic violence conversation because of his own insecurities. I mean, thank you, Mitch, for reiterating the existence of exactly what we're talking about. As if we needed any more evidence. You know, the, the idea that, you know, a social justice warrior is some sort of a slur. It's some sort of a bad thing. Where I grew up, the high school team I played for, the Warriors... That was never a bad thing, <laughs> although it probably fits into this idea around masculinity and sport. I noticed a lot of comments here on sport. Boy, is that something we could dig into. It's not a bad thing to be a social justice warrior. In my mind, that's about as honorable as it gets. So the language can get really weaponized. Some of you were talking about the, the sort of the patriarchy that exists in policing or in corporate structure or, I mean... I guess what I'm really trying to say, Sarah Hoyles, is how grateful I am that we're not the only ones that are keeping it real here. This audience that shows up every single day, I mean, I know you were keeping your eye on the live chat as well. It's, it's like intuitive comment after intuitive comment. If and when we start putting up billboards across Canada, I, I think we may have to advertise that we do have the most decent audience on the Internet. I'm really impressed. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really neat to see people being vulnerable and, and sharing their personal experience, but also showing up for each other. Um, yeah, so it's 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 very touching to to watch the live chat and and see how people are sharing. And yeah, what'd you take from that conversation? Was there something that jumped out at you? Oh, boy. I mean, there were these there big were so themes. Many. <laughs> there were these big themes, but. I mean, to me, I, th I think something that's kind of new to the conversation or newer to the conversation is the idea of the power of language and uh, that women are usually put at the center. So violence against women or a battered woman, and it actually eliminates the perpetrator and it, it negates the importance of the perpetrator. So I really appreciated Jackson's perspective on that and how, you know, Roman House is saying, no, no, we're we're focusing on the folks that are actually perpetrating. Um, that's where the problem resides, um, not with the survivors. I mean, the survivors obviously have to are on their own journey and are going to have to, you know, process that and, and get support in that. But they're not the perpetrators. They're not the problem. Hmm. Blake says uh, fighting in hockey is archaic. And if that makes me a soy boy for saying it, I sure am. Um I love that. Guilty. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, and again, like, hey, real talk. I'm going to tell you how I feel about things. I, I love fighting in hockey. Um, and and maybe, I mean, I, I, I think we need to have, I would love to have an honest and just open conversation. Maybe we have guests. Maybe we don't need guests about sport. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Angry Adam's on there saying, why, why do we separate boys and girls at sports at a young age? Why do we? I know that other people will take issue with that and talk about sport as a as a wonderful way to define character and teamwork and understanding about early understanding of accountability and striving for excellence and the role of sport. And I don't know that there's a right answer there. I think we'd find in this 
audience in this community many different opinions on the value of sport, some of the problems in sport. Oh yeah, I, I mean, mean, even if you, if you like fighting in hockey, we could we could do a week on we could do a week <laughs> on fighting in hockey. I mean, I I'm not a oh, this is gonna this is gonna go down like a lead balloon. Speak freely, obviously. <laughs> oh boy, um, I'm ready for it. I'm gonna just embrace it. So, not a big hockey fan, and because of the um, the toxic masculinity that's yeah. in there, and also just how white white it is um i really enjoy the nba Mm. because of the social justice aspect because of the diversity that's there i mean just look at the The nba's done a great job oh my goodness Or let me say is doing a great job i mean the, the, the work is not done but the nba even the nfl the NBA, there's a lot of cost. Bar- Basketball is a sport where there's a lot of cost barriers removed, and I think it's yep. more accessible to people. I know the NHL has been taking those steps, trying to get hockey in front of kids from from you know, so uh, let's say marginalized backgrounds or that may otherwise be denied the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I was like, uh oh, this. I don't know if we should go here, but um, why not? This is the whole point of this show. That's why people are here. They're yeah. here for these kind of conversations, right? For, I'm not. I'm not going to pretend. You know, if, if 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 Greg or whoever else says I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of fighting in hockey. I I am a fan of fighting in hockey, and some people may be critical of that, and that's fine. But that's why we didn't. We don't come here to agree with everybody every single day. That's not the point of the show. Right. Um, I'm agreeing so, with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Very well done. You can let us know what you think. Keep it going on the live chat. We promise to keep it real with you. Uh, let me remind you about the the, the team at Friesen Brothers. This is a, a great opportunity that they're putting in front of you, most especially if you don't yet have a plan in place for Mother's Day. They're doing Mother's Day picnic boxes um this is the first time only that they're doing them they're brand new store in edmonton in fort saskatchewan and in stony plain in those three stores all right you need to be uh ordering them ahead of time they make them up specially for you these are like the charcuterie platters i mean just beautiful limited quantities available booking will close friday morning for sunday pickup you can learn more at freezen.com that's f-r-e-s-o-n.com this is your day to celebrate all those moms who've done such incredible things in our lives as if i need to explain why we celebrate our moms freezen.com for the mother's day picnic box our friends at kubi energy want you to know they're hiring they're currently hiring journeyman electricians This is a great opportunity for me to remind you that Jake Kubiski, the founder and CEO of Kubi Energy, was an oil field electrician for a lot of years before he moved into the the so-called green energy space. And this is an awesome opportunity for people that are involved uh, in that field or certified there to get maybe a new lease on their career life. That again, kubienergy.ca, your best way to apply. You can email them info at kubienergy.ca if you'd like to submit your resume. We're also proud to be partnering up with Power Ed, Athabasca University, offering short online and on demand professional development courses and certificates, leading edge, flexible, on demand learning. You can learn more at powered.ca. We're talking about courses and certificates and things like leadership digital wellness, allyship, and inclusion. We're just kind of talking about that. Project management, artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital transformation, and more. Power Ed assists organizations to develop and deploy their own digital learning strategies. Again, learn more at powered.ca. Do I understand correctly? We have our uh, guest a little bit early here this morning. Is that what's going on right now? Okay, well, fantastic. Well, wh- why not just get into this? We're talking about Tarek Fancy? Okay, awesome. I, w- I, was, I was sort of thinking that this 20 minutes I was going to have to wait to talk to this guy was going to be agony. So I'm so <laughs> great he's ready to join us now. I mean, this guy, uh, if you want to talk about sustainable investing, I know this is a hard swerve when it comes to subject matter, but I'm sure we're going to find some parallels here. When it comes to accountability, when it comes to trends, everybody's talking about going green. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that we saw in the annual letter, in the annual report, the CEO of BlackRock. I mean, this is the world's biggest fund manager. I think it's something like $9 trillion in assets that they manage talking about sustainable investing and the trends. And we've seen evidence. I mean, if you're living or working in our neck of the woods here in Western Canada, you see French giant Total just writing down big time assets in the oil sands. You see people moving or taking their investments elsewhere. 
the premise that nobody's putting money into traditional oil and gas anymore. It's not where the market's going. It's not where investors are going. So it's not where we're going either. Well, Tark Fancy was brought on, uh, joining BlackRock in late 2017 as its first chief investment officer for sustainable investing. It wasn't there long. Just a couple of years, and I'm excited to find out exactly why. Tark Fancy joining us live. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. I just noticed the conversation with uh, what for me was about fighting and hockey. That's a tough act to follow when you're talking about the financial services industry, but I'll try my best. Yeah, no kidding. If the, if the metaphor exists, then we'll take advantage of it, and if not, we'll just move on. Uh, Tark, why, why don't we... Why don't we start by establishing what the opportunity looked like that drew you to BlackRock, a senior executive position. If my math is right, you weren't even yet 40 years of age, obviously a huge personal and career opportunity, but also a big opportunity if you take a look at where the trends were going, at least at that time. As you showed up for your first Mm -hmm. day at work in 2017, where was your head at and what was your mandate? Well, so I had spent a long career in the investing industry, had been kind of mainly in the U.S., although I'm Canadian and I'm from Toronto. Uh, and then had learned to invest. And then I spent a few years creating an organization called Rumi. It's an education technology nonprofit, a Canadian one that does work around the world. Um, and you can see we're doing micro learning stuff at Rumi.org. It's all open and free. And I'd kind of worked on both bottom lines, right? Financial bottom lines and investing and then social bottom lines, building Rumi from the ground up. And so I was kind of brought in to see how we could merge those two, right? As a seasoned investor who can kind of look at how we can uh invest and create investment profits while at the same time also, you know, creating measurable gains to society. And, you know, what I found was that generally speaking, as a trained investor who went in and looked across, really I was responsible for integrating environmental and social considerations into all of the nine trillion. For the most part, it's just mainly marketing, right? I mean, I'd like to say that there's really something substantive in there that's being done that's going to solve social problems, but you know, and not just climate change and, and energy related, but inequality and a whole host of other issues. And generally speaking, that wasn't happening. It was, you know, Wall Street in not just BlackRock, but the entire industry creating a bunch of things that amount to marketing and PR spin uh, as a way to fight fee compression and sell new funds. Except for it, it, it has, I mean, to state the very obvious and you're the expert, not me, a huge ripple effect. Right. I mean, in in a jurisdiction like Alberta, this type of trend or the reporting around this type of trend um, has a huge influence on people's career decisions, on investment decisions, on a personal level, all the way up to to a corporate level. What what was your moment of of enlightenment or or, or where did your perspective change? Was it over time or was was this epiphany moment part of it? It was over time, right? I went in and I drank the Kool-Aid, right? I thought that there there's a real opportunity here to do something that's a win-win for, you know, the, the, for people and planet or profits and planet. Um, and, you know, the reality is that over time, I started to realize that the way the industry is structured, you really can't build the kinds of things that they're saying you can build without proper regulatory reform, right? The reality is that no matter what it is, if there's a business practice that makes money, that creates profit, that unless something changes, someone will finance it, right? I mean, I, I joke that if drug cartels became illegal, became legal tomorrow, you know, Goldman Sachs bankers would be on a plane five seconds later going down to Mexico to pitch the Sinaloa cartel on an IPO. The reality is the entire structure of the industry, they're legally obligated and financially incentivized to create profits. And for the most part, um, that means that, you know, that, that uh, a lot of causes that we think are important whether let's say it's fighting inequality or this or this or that, they don't really get done in the current structure unless government goes in and actually changes some of the some of the precepts around that. That's not that's not that controversial in Canada. Uh, in the U.S., it is. I mean, after decades of being told that the only good government is small government and that you know, they're you know, generally speaking, the free markets solve all problems, which I think doesn't make any sense because there's no such thing as a free market. All markets have rules. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough to get that message across. And so business is out there now saying, don't worry, we can solve all of your social problems, right? There's a, the business roundtable in the U.S. talked about stakeholder capitalism. And there's this whole push to say that, you know, don't worry, business will do all the right things all, all by ourselves because it's in our profit interest to do it. And I was looking at data across $9 trillion of assets, which is the, you know, the largest, it's a microcosm of capitalism. And the fundamental problem is that it actually doesn't pay to be responsible, right? I mean, there's a reason that 
Facebook addicts us to, you know, apps that harm our mental health, right? It, it makes money. It's the whole reason a bunch of these other things are happening across all sectors. I, I think it's, you'll, you'll feel the energy piece most in Western Canada. And, and I totally understand why, you know, people are sensitive to that aspect, but it's really across the board, right? It's tech companies, it's monopolies, it's other things where it's like a sports game, right? At some point, the competitive uh, markets need a referee, just like in sports, if we're playing hockey and slashing people in the face wins games. You know, at some point people say, okay, well, you know, where's, you know, where are the referees? Like, can someone give this guy a penalty? Um, and, um, you know, uh, it doesn't tend to happen, right? Because if you have an entire narrative that says the free market will solve everything and, you know, possible, then, then you end up in a situation where business says they're doing a bunch of things that they really aren't doing because they're not profitable. I knew you were going to find a way to work in hockey and refereeing and enforcement. I knew and it, it took you less than five minutes. Uh, well done. So I, I'm going to admit I am guilty of coming into this interview, uh, looking at this entire conversation um, through the lens of this having energy implications. Absolutely. One hundred percent. And I'm grateful that you pointed out that it's a bigger conversation than that. Um, we, we talk about ESG and, and, and maybe you can, so we're talking about environmental, social and, and corporate governance, right? And that, so, so, so can, can you help me widen out the lens? Um, you talked about tech as, as another example, but, but in the concept of sustainable investing and, and where you started to believe that this role at BlackRock might not be the best fit for you because you'd lost your conviction around it or your belief in it, so to speak, what are some other examples that, that have nothing to do with energy? So the, the, you know, what's most interesting is that in the last few years, the S in ESG or social, the social bit has actually grown the most. And so think about uh, the Me Too movement, right? Five years ago, your average large tech company probably didn't care that much about gender issues. I mean, they would say that they did, but realistically, if they could hire a bunch of guys who program well and, you know, or they think program well and give them, you know, a leg up against the competition, that's frankly all that they were paid and structured to think about. Um, Me Too happened. There was all these movements. Suddenly, you know, even Google had employees, you know, marching outside and protesting their gender pay policies. And so suddenly it became a material risk, right? So then suddenly they cared about it. Black Lives Matter is another example of that, right? Inequality, rising inequality in all Western countries. Those are all examples of things that probably, you know, climate change is, is a large and important one. It's slower moving, but the social issues are the ones that I think are actually even more acute in the last few years because they've had a capacity to grab public attention and in ways that, you know, companies feel like they need to be on the right side of that. So how did, when you started to, you know, transition your own, you were there for about two years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you left, you, you, you write about, you had a great piece in the globe. Um, you've actually written a ton about this as with regards to background. I've really enjoyed your writing in a number of pieces in the economist and the globe and others, um, uh, some family reasons you left to start up your own thing, which we can talk about, but, but, but you weren't there for, for much longer than two years. Did you start to, to vocalize, uh, these feelings among your peers, the senior executives? And if so, how, how were those thoughts landing with a thud or softly, or how did that go? You know, it's interesting. My views kind of evolved a bit after I left. Uh, While I was there, I came to the conclusion that it wasn't going to create a great deal of social impact, but, uh, you know, or, or really social or environmental impact or anything, right? It struck me as being just understanding the industry and how investing works is largely window dressing. Um, but I didn't think it was terribly harmful, right? I thought about if, you know, if climate change is a serious issue, let's say we need to deal with kind of like a cancer that's slowly growing in, in, in the body, it's kind of like giving wheatgrass to a cancer patient. Like there's no reason to believe it's going to address the cancer, but you know, maybe it's, it's not harmful at least. Uh, it's only after I left that, you know, in the last year, you know, the pandemic hit and other things started happening. I started to realize that it was actually worse than I thought because it was very clear that the marketing messages coming out of business and the financial services industry, you know, really in, on one level to probably forestall overdue regulation, particularly in the U S um, on that industry, which never happened after the financial crisis in the way it needed to. Um, but also, you know, because they could sell a bunch of products now with higher fees, you could sort of see that like it was creating a bit of a societal placebo, right? Where, where actually the wheatgrass may be harmful because it's actually delaying the patient from, from undergoing chemotherapy. So I started working with Ryerson last year, Ryerson University, 
we did a study. We found that in Canada, actually, people's attitudes don't change that much. If you show them a bunch of headlines around like business is going to solve all of your problems, they say, OK, that's like nice. But like realistically, we still need government to, to solve systemic issues. Right. It's not even saying what specific policy. It's not the federal government, provincial government. It's just saying, look, a systemic issue needs a systemic solution. Right. We saw that with COVID. Right. You needed to close the borders in some way. You needed to close the highest risk venues, make masks mandatory indoors. Those were super painful things to do, but the science showed us, um, and we saw in the numbers that like it means that you can end the crisis faster. Um, and I started realizing that that you know we were we were being misled on some level. And in the U.S., the data actually showed that you show people these headlines, and actually they say later, oh, we don't need government regulation. We don't need government to do anything, right? And that's really worrying, right? Because all of the policy experts across the board, you know, they don't just say the science is is one thing, you know, we need to fight inequality because it causes political instability, we need to fight climate change because this, that, and the other. They actually have real policy recommendations. None of those policy recommendations are, let's leave it to Wall Street to self-regulate itself, because that clearly has not worked over many decades. And that is effectively what's being, you know, peddled to the public right now. How do you, how do you uh, interpret the significance or how do you apply the significance of, of the whole GameStop gong show uh, last year yeah. and, 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 and like the, the citizen rallying and the role that Reddit played in potentially bringing down a major hedge fund. And some people mm-hmm. saw immense growth in their portfolios. Some people saw their portfolio become somewhat of a vacuum. Um, I saw people asserting that that authorities that the SEC should have jumped in. I saw other people saying that the market should sort itself out. People can approach at their own peril. Is, is that out of context for what we're talking about here or is there an application? It, it actually does apply. It's fascinating. The GameStop thing, you know, I, I, it kind of crossed my radar at the beginning, and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. But I thought about it through purely financial terms, right? I thought oh, someone's long the stock, some people are shorting it, whatever. Uh, it was only because my team at Rumi, because they were all tech people, right? And all of my team are Redditors. And they were the ones who first brought it to my attention. They said, by the way, um, this seems to be more of a big F you to the system and to Wall Street as much as it is like a real investment strategy where people were trying to, to make money. It was really like a, a statement. And I thought that was fascinating because what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years is that after the financial crisis, there's been very little by way of actually aggressively regulating these companies, right? I mean, particularly, I mean, and again, this is a little bit more of a US issue in some ways, but you know, we feel the knock-on effects of it here in Canada regardless. And so, you know, you have less the rules have been tended to be rigged in, in ways that benefit the incumbents. Um, and they haven't been fixed after the financial crisis. And that seemed to be a lot of what people with the GameStop saga were upset about, right? That the rules didn't seem to be equal for the little guy investor uh, as they are for the hedge fund or the large bank. And again, my experience would be that that's 100% true, right? I mean, that the system has not really been built for the little guy. It hasn't been built for the long-term public interest. It hasn't been built for the, you know, people who are just out- excluded from the system, right? It's You have a system now that is really... In- really benefits most the oldest and the richest in society. And it's the and it's the mechanisms and the banks and the entities that they control. And it's really just not at all reflective of the interests of the public at large. With your permission, I'd like to drag this back into a conversation about energy. It doesn't have to stay yes. there or or languish there, but 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 the interest I think here on behalf of a significant number of our audience members is going to be around the future implications. And whether or not the, whether or not the market might return to something um, right now, from an investment standpoint, I'm certainly not an expert, nor do I ever advise people seriously on what to do with their money. But you could probably pick up some energy stocks right now cheaper than you would have 10 years ago because of some of these trends that people are aware of and because of some of the advice that people are getting. But we also see that there's some instability on, on, on energy security, whether that's pipeline development or whether that's susceptibility to what we saw down in Texas or or what have you. I mean, we could really get deep into this. Um, where do you see the market going? And might it be astute for some people? I mean, we hear the argument all the time here in Alberta. People say that, that yeah, people are transitioning with energy, but it's going to be over the course of decades. There's always going to be a demand for oil and gas. There are the, the, the conversations about Canada's relationship with the U.S. and the energy security, um, you know, the lure of that relationship. Do you think that some of the the stocks or even the market as a whole that's taken a bit of a I mean, it's taken its lumps over the past number of years. Do you think that that trend could be reversed on mass big picture? It certainly could. I mean, I, I wouldn't know specifically because I haven't followed a lot of the stocks 
carefully, but I can see how it could overshoot the other way. I mean, I'd say two things. First of all, in general, personal view is that uh, the markets are largely overvalued and, uh, and are going to take a serious correction in the next few years because really they're overdue a correction and there's rallying and there's just every sign of a bubble and virtually every asset class that I look at. And my investing background was distressed investing. So we would raise money in advance of a market crash. We raised three and a half billion in 2007, predicting that there'd be a crash. I would be a little bit careful right now about the markets because I'm not personally comfortable with where they're valued. Um, so there could be, everyone gets knocked a little bit, right? In the next few years, that, that's a possibility. Um, but, but I'd say specific to energy companies, I mean, I think there could be a bounce back. I mean, my general view is that, you know, we need, it's not like we need to just kill fossil fuels tomorrow, right? Like clearly we all need the industry to exist and to keep doing what it's doing because the global economy relies on it. I think there is a transition that can be done that is, I think it has to be led by government, right? Because it needs industrial policy. It needs to be something where we say, hey, there are parts of the country where, um, you know, th we can't do this forever. But we also know that industry has been built around this and people have their jobs and livelihoods built around it. And so, number one, you need to share the pain across the country. It can't be that, you know, hey, you happen to be living in a place where, you know, we've just figured out that the, the science telling us that, you know, the, the resources you have are we, don't, we need less of them. So I guess, you know, you all get to be unemployed. Like it, it obviously can't be that it has to be shared. And I think that a lot of the new jobs that come out of aggressive and, you know, industrial policy around driving capital and industry around the green transition ought to be based in exactly the industry where people understand energy, right? They know how to build it, they know how to sell it, they know, you know all of the aspects of it. But that does require effective government policy that's inclusive of all the regions. It's thoughtful about how to achieve this and it has a long-term view. I have not seen that out of government yet in any Western country. Instead, what I'm seeing is people kind of focusing on the short term, kicking the can down the road, doing nothing it sounds like it could be good for the energy sector, right? Because nothing, you know, maybe you're afraid of rev regulation coming in. I would argue it's actually worse because eventually people are going to realize that, oh my God, we didn't do what we we're supposed to do. And then you're going to have sort of this way too late reaction that's very drastic that, you know, just takes an ax to entire industries. And instead of us transitioning carefully and effectively in the way that we need to with a 10, 20, 30 year uh, approach that doesn't you know, give a black eye to a bunch of people in regions where, you know, by no fault of their own, they're sitting on top of resources that we now realize we can't exploit in the same way that we thought we could, you know, but it needs, it needs to be something like that. And it can't be sort of haphazard. What I'm seeing is very, very short-term oriented stuff, both from policymakers who seem to be okay with leaving it to the banks and everything to figure out, right? And then those banks and all who have absolutely no incentive, you know, they're structured to great create profit. And so, the reality is that for a lot of them, marketing yourself as being sustainable is in the short term much more profitable and actually making long term investments to be sustainable. We've got a great the comment. The problem with that is sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry Tarek. Well, let, well, well, let me just you. throw I'll just throw this in and then I'll let you keep yeah, going because it, it just it, it supports what you're saying. Greg is watching right now and on our live chat, he says, This is pretty much why I left being an environmental consultant. He says, You're really not doing that much good and you're just allowing corporations to look better because they're cleaning up their mess. I mean, to a large extent, that's the you know, the biggest problem I'll tell tell you is, is short termism, right? So think of it this way. The average CEO in the US, the average tenure is five years. That's the shortest it's been in decades. The average CEO pay is now 320 times the, industry, the average worker in that industry. That's the highest it's been in decades, right? So the problem is you have a whole bunch of issues that matter to the long-term public interest. They matter especially to younger people, right? Because they're gonna end up inheriting whatever, you know, whatever we do in the next 10 or 20 years when they finally reach le leadership roles. And uh, if you have a system where people are not paid to think about the long term, right, they make all their money in the next few years, you end up with a terrible situation where basically they're going to do, and it's not about individuals. I mean, there are some individuals that are better and worse, but it's a systemic problem, right? The incentives are, let's squeeze out as much money as we can now. If it, you know, if it leaves, it kicks the can down the road and there's a bigger problem created, that's someone else's problem. That's literally exactly what I, we saw with the financial crisis, right? I mean, people were making a lot of money, taking undue risks that, um, you know, there was, a, I remember reading the Wall Street Journal, there was a phrase where they called it, you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, right? Because these, these strategies were really high risk and they were eventually the chickens are going to come home to roost. And everyone said, all these bankers are really stupid because, you know, look, they picked up all these pennies and then they got run over by the steamroller in 2008. 
And I was like, no, they're not stupid. We're stupid because they took the pennies home when they bought like new houses in the Hamptons. And we, the public, got run over by the steamroller, right? Because effectively, the public taxpayer had to bail out the banks. But they didn't give back their bonuses. They didn't give back their pay for taking all of those undue risks that built up massive risk in the system. Because when it crashed, they just they just took off, right? And so you're seeing that now with a whole host of social issues, right? Inequality is extremely dangerous to Western democracies, right? I would argue that a lack of inclusion for rural versus urban communities is one of the biggest problems I've seen. Like, I don't blame people in the U.S. for, for voting for, for Trump. It's funny, I found my, I mean, I, I, I do because he's an idiot. I mean, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to, that's my personal view. But, you know, I mean, he he banned Muslims from the U.S., right? I went, I, I'm a Muslim. I went to school there. You know, it's a place that I know well. But I also looked at it and said, listen, if you have an economic system that does not include people whose jobs have been lost due to trade, have been lost due to automation, and you have all of these gains from all those things. And instead of us just expanding the pie and redistributing it fairly, we're just expanding the pie and all the benefits go to the richest few who own all the companies and have all the capital and stock. That's extraordinarily dangerous, right? And that and that's a problem alongside climate change that I think needs to be solved together. And you know, those are the kind of problems where if we don't right now, we see a system where they're just short-term oriented. They're gonna keep squeezing shareholder value in the next few years, eventually, you know, younger people are going to have to bear the costs of that inaction. And, you know, it's going to be like the financial crisis all over again. Well, so Tark, you don't you don't come across as as a pessimist. You don't come across as some sort of a doomsday prophet. Far from it, as a matter of fact. And I want to talk about Rumi um, and what you're doing now. But let, let me just ask you. So for the people that are that are hearing a guy like you who's savvy and optimistic and comes across as positive, say, yeah, like kind of a whole bunch of this is, is essentially bullshit and it's like short term thinking and it's going to get unsustainable and it's not what it says it is. And, and heck, you left a pretty plumb position, I would imagine, uh, at BlackRock uh, based in part because you, you didn't really find your own future plan there. What, what do you say to the people that are going to be somewhat dismayed or even discouraged by this conversation? I mean, is there reason for optimism? I think there is. And the reason I'd say that there's a chance for optimism is that, you know, generally speaking, that, you know, a lot of these crises, you have uh, a lot of sort of people are lulled into a sense of complacency, right? Because they're focusing on short term, not thinking about long term issues. I think for climate change in particular, the earlier we think about effective policies to at a countrywide level, make a transition, the better. So it's not just haphazard. And the reason I'm optimistic is that the pandemic has showed us in some form that with a systemic crisis, you need a systemic solution. That solution can only be led by government. Um, we may debate about the specific policies at a government level, but you just can't leave it to the free market, right? I mean, that would have been like for COVID, like let's just leave everything open and see if everyone's responsible. I mean, it doesn't work, right? It's kind of like what we're doing in Alberta, Tark. to be honest with you. I actually have seen pretty good, uh, I haven't actually stayed that close to the numbers there, but it seemed like they were had done a decent job for a while. I mean, I tell you what, Ontario is, is not doing so great in the last couple of months. I was very smug versus my vis-a-vis -vis my friends in the U.S. when yeah. I came back. Yeah. I'm not so smug in the last few months. Yeah, no kidding. So this, I mean, this is, uh, uh, there, isn't it interesting? There's, I was, I was saying earlier today to to uh, uh, folks I interviewed probably an hour ago now. That I said, you know, you almost have to in interview in any interview these days, regardless in any conversation, even private conversations, regardless of subject matter, you you find ways to to interweave the exploration of your ideas with COVID-19 because the pandemics had such a demonstrable effect on everything. Um, you talk about some parallels between COVID-19 or managing a pandemic and climate change. Um, do you think that the, do you think the pandemic over the course of this, and, and obviously this is a huge and ma massive and loaded question about post pandemic recovery, and you could hit it from a number of different angles, but, but do you think that, there will be some sort of a mental reset, or do you think there might even be an industry-wide reset or something that happens? What would be the long-term impact on markets and investing that you might attribute to COVID-19? I personally think that the most effective thing could, that could come is a reversal of a narrative that was sort of became popular out of the 1980s, sort of around Thatcher and Reagan era where people just said, listen, you know, we can just leave free markets to solve all problems and that'll work. Um, and the truth is I'm a former investment banker, I have an MBA, I'm, I'm clearly a capitalist, but I think markets need rules and those rules need to be updated, right? And, and it's not, again, it's, it's around climate change and how you can bend down the curve of 
greenhouse gas emissions, much as we bent, you know, flattened the curve for COVID-19 infections. But it's also around things like, you know, how do tech companies operate, right? Like if Uber comes to town and, you know, they don't pay taxes and they don't pay insurance and they, as a result, are able to be cheaper than a lot of alternatives simply because of regulatory arbitrage and they build massive market share and then suddenly they have a winner takes all approach. Like, that's something where you need policymakers to actually be thinking intelligently about doing something about it. And we haven't seen that. And I think a lot of policymakers have sort of just been deferential to the private sector and not in a way that I think is good, right? Like deferential to the private sector, if you're saying the market can figure out problems, if we set up the rules, that's kind of like saying, hey, if you have good referees and rules in hockey, then you'll leave the players to figure out how to score as many goals as they can within those. That makes perfect sense for any competitive you know, endeavor, right? Like any competitive endeavor has to have rules, but then within those, you allow competition to flourish. That's actually not what's happened. Right. When people are saying that the, the free market will solve it, it actually seems to be like a crony capitalism where, you know, you're just letting the biggest companies basically lobby and, you know, push their interests forward. And, and I'm not sure that that's in the interest of the private sector at all. It's not in the interest of business because the 25 year old employee at a company is not really benefiting from that. If it's, if we're leaving long term problems to be solved by them when they are, you know, 45 or 50. Uh, and it's not in the interest of a whole bunch of regions that are kind of get, get left behind. Um, and so what I think the biggest thing that happens is you actually hopefully get effective policy making and, and maybe governments that actually have ideas, right? I mean, that are not just kind of like politicians that are kind of playing people against one another and, you know, just sort of giving lip service to what they think people want to hear, but, you know, actually um, doing something that, you know, can actually set us up for a long term, you know, 20, 30 years where we need to be. But do you we know China's doing that, right? How, yeah, I, China's a little bit, I mean obviously hugely different but but when we take a look at election cycles they can factor into the mix in so many ways as the shelf life of the average corporate ceo right i mean i'm a and i don't i don't want to bring nothing but pessimism to the table either i want to bring some reason for optimism too but but i'm also a realist and i can't say this uh, sweeping across the board but generally speaking i think you could make the argument that that politicians are not always working in the best interests of the populace either. They're concerned about their own political careers, and those oftentimes come up for renewal, so to speak, every four years. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the short election cycle, does it, it creates a massive problem, right? Because if the public just wants to hear certain things, then, you know, politicians are going to respond because their bottom line is getting elected. Um, you know, honestly, one of the most interesting things I've heard was from, uh, I went to some event, like, right before the pandemic hit, and Brian Mulroney was speaking there. And I wasn't a particular fan of him in the past, but he made some comments that I really liked where he said, listen, like these days, we lack politicians who are willing to go up and stand up and say, listen, this is what's in the long-term public interest. This is what it is in the interest of Canadians 10 or 20 years out. I don't care if people don't want to hear that. I don't care if that's an inconvenient thing to hear. I'm going to tell you what I think is really important for Canada. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a vision. There may be some short-term pain. It's not going to necessarily work for everybody, but this is a vision that you know you can understand and hang your hat on. Uh, and his point was that we have not seen politicians willing to do that, right? We've seen ones that are a bit more deferential. They kind of pander. They seem to be kind of focused heavily on like what some focus group said or what you know um, what seems to play in the near here and now. And they're not willing to be bold and show that bold leadership even when it's unpopular. Um, I'm not saying that any particular leader or party is doing that, but honestly, that that's the only way out that I can see is that there's a snapback to people saying, hey, you know what, like I'm sick of leaders who just kind of seem to say what they think people want to hear. Uh, and I, I personally, I'd love someone to go up and say, hey, this is going to suck. It's going to hurt for the next few years, but here's a real vision of where we need to go. And they show conviction and there's authenticity. And you say, you know, uh, you know, this, this, you know, I can, I can, I can get behind that, even if it's, if it's a painful message. You know, we have problems that need to be solved, and this, this person has a solution that I believe in for the next ten or twenty years. And I think, particularly for younger people, um, they'll, 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 they may follow that, right? But we haven't really seen it yet. I think you nailed it. And I th and I think that we're going to see it. I think that the, you know, the elections subsequent to these governments we see, whether we're talking about uh, the next presidential election, that feels like ages away, the campaigning is going to start in about a year. People need to keep that in mind. Whether we see the next federal election here, provincial, even municipal elections, there's going to be an entirely new context. I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but but debt loads are higher than ever before. Unemployment is higher than ever before. The, the, the budgetary implications of COVID-19 and pandemic recoveries are going to have tax implications and spending implications. But we've also come alive and people are, are, are more engaged and intrigued by 
concepts like universal basic incomes or 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 mm-hmm. better paid sick days or so there's a lot in the mix but i think you're right i think that politicians or parties that campaign on uh, some sort of idea that everything's fine we're all familiar with the the gif of the the dog sitting at the table while everything's burning yeah, the inferno yeah. you know exactly the one i'm talking about everything's fine it's not but uh, a politician i think or a leader that can bring a plan to the people that says yeah it does sting a bit or it might suck or it's not ideal, uh, but here's the plan. Uh, I think that people will, first of all, not just give a lot of credit to that, but I think people will actively look for that. I hope so, right? Because someone like that can move the debate from sort of the short term pandering of like, you know, whatever people they think people want to hear for the next little while. And honestly, a lot of them just seem, a lot of the political leaders, again, I wouldn't name anyone specifically, but they just seem to be office seekers. You know what I mean? It's like whatever they can say to get in there will is good enough. Right. But, um, you know, they're, but to your point, they're the dog, right. They're just kind of tweaking the system here and there. And it's like, okay, well, we're kind of running into a problem where inequality is at epic levels. We have serious strategic issues with China. We also have to solve climate change. These are all interconnected and they require bold leadership, right? And that bold leadership might be a 10 or 20 year plan that's unpopular. But if you have a bunch of people sitting at the top and they're sort of like, just kind of, hey, I I have all the, it's credentialism, right? Like, look at my resume, I have all this stuff. Now you should put me in power so I can just kind of maintain the status quo. I feel like that style of leadership has probably passed its sell by date or anyway, I hope it is. Otherwise we're just gonna waste more valuable time yeah, with long-term yeah. problems, we really need to get to get on top of. Kim's got a great comment on our live chat. Says we live in a world where unelected politicians are campaigning twenty-four-seven, and most elected politicians are as well. And because you know we won't elect long-term thinkers, we're a short-sighted, selfish society. That from Kim. That's an interesting point. <laughs> um, Tark, before we thank you for your time and and, le- and let you continue with your day, I have to ask you about. I mean, one of the big reasons why you left BlackRock is Rumi. Uh, mm-hmm. where you're the CEO, it's a nonprofit dedicated to removing barriers for learning in underserved communities. Can you take us into this? Yeah, so it's kind of a cool story at the beginning. I, I actually left in the industry in 2013 to create Rumi. It was because my business school roommate passed away of cancer. He, he and I were both young, same age. Um, you know, he, he got stage four melanoma, and so he went and created uh, a charity to, do, to help education in, in Kenya. Kenya's where my parents were born and raised. He, he my friend, Lone, Mickey Lohenberg is Dutch. He had blonde hair, blue eyed guy was suddenly in Africa doing this. And you could see, I, I was certainly, you know, really inspired by seeing that uh, what he really cared about when he knew that the writing was on the wall. Uh, that com- pushed me to do Rumi. The idea behind Rumi was that you can learn anything for free online, but the people who have the most to gain are usually the least likely to access it. And so we built a whole bunch of cool tech tools to bring the free digital learning revolution to the offline world. We grew it to over 30 countries, refugee camps, girls and women in Afghanistan, here at, for indigenous communities here at home in Canada. And the latest thing we're working on is micro learning. And it's a really cool concept where you can take all of the engagement mechanics of social media, how social media companies kind of get you hooked. You do a five or six minute session, you get a dopamine rush, you get to do something quick, it's all mobile first. And we said, hey, why don't we try evolving to use those mechanisms to actually bring value to people, right? So you can do micro learning and you can build a skill in five minutes and you get a dopamine rush. But, you know, if you do that over a long time, it's going to have way better mental health effects than using Instagram every single day for the same amount of time. And so it's kind of like Netflix meets, if you look at the site at roomy.org, it looks like Netflix, but it's kind of got a Wikipedia engine underneath it because we get people creating content that, um, are experts in different areas. So um, to give you an example, companies do it. So we have employee, you know, volunteerism things and Amazon and Carlisle and people have created content that's all skills based. We have, uh, you know, celebrities like Chris Hadfield just created um, a bite on open curiosity. Um, Ryan, I have no doubt that you'd have a lot of great skills to offer to people on an open and free platform that, you know, uh, tons of Canadians are using, especially since the pandemic hit. So if you'd be interested, you should uh, you should pen a bite also, right? It's it's like Wikipedia, but we vet it, and then it's all open and free. And you'd be you know you'd have micro a micro learning lesson to uh, to share with Canadians and frankly people globally. And in fact, you even get you get data back, so you'd know that it's being used in the Philippines. It's being actually used in over 100 countries now. So there are girls in Afghanistan who may end up uh, benefiting from you know skills and expertise that you and so many people have to offer. 
This is my very intrigued face. <laughs> yeah, and you me. can use memes in them. If you check it out, there's dog memes. It's, listen, it's for youth, right? So we had to make it engaging. I just created my first TikTok video a few days ago because we're hiring um, for a role. And uh, one of the people on my team took a few clips that I had given her and she crunched them into a 25 second TikTok video that honestly looks like I'm on crack. If you check it, I'm not even joking when I say that. It's it's just kind of insane, but um, you know, I, I love technology and I'm a bit newer to TikTok, but you know, I'm learning that there's certain engagement. If, if you figure out the right formula and you make it interesting for people, you can use it for different things, including learning and you know, helping them build themselves up. I need to, I, I got on TikTok. I have an account, but I have, I have yet to post. I don't know what it is. I just have this like, I don't know. I just it seems like a lot of work and I don't totally get it. Um, but also I feel like I said, I just turned 44. I said, so I'm either an old young guy or a young old guy. And I would prefer to be the old young guy, uh, which means that I can still be on TikTok and learn how to use it. Uh, and that's where a lot of actually, I mean, even to be serious for a second, uh, people that would sort of dismiss TikTok as a bit of a joke with just a bunch of silly videos. The amount of com of astute commentary there and the audience share that people are seizing, uh, you cannot ignore it. It is a thing. Uh, I'm really not. Surpri has. I'm not surprised to hear you're on there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's the whole thing, right? Is that we're trying to connect those dots so that people spend some time in TikTok, but they also spend some time on Rumi, and it's all open, it's all free, and you know, it's like take. It's like a diet. And imagine I stopped drinking a bottle of Coke every single day. I don't do that, but if I did, six months of that, like I'm going to clearly be healthier. It's the same kind of thing with social media, right? If you take some time, TikTok's addictive and it's fun, but you take some time away from that and you use it on something like Rumi. Uh, six months of mixing that up a little bit. So it's a little bit less social media, which, you know, has, has all these negative mental health effects. It increases suicide rates, all these things. And you mix it in with a bit of skills building. I mean, that's that's a mental health diet, right? And in six months time, if you do that pretty well, hopefully you see some some pretty cool benefits. This is so great. I'm uh, You do have my full attention. I'm not ignoring you. I'm not tuning you out. Far from it. But I'm just taking a look at, at Rumi.org and it's fantastic. Like signs of cyberbullying, eight minutes uh, or, or, or a nine minute view on make a new friend when you're out at school or three minutes. Anybody can watch. I mean, this is the length of a uh, sound like I'm 90 years old. That's the length of a pop song. But like, how do you know, how do I set personal boundaries with a stranger? Three minutes. You know, uh, how do I help my friend experiencing a panic attack? I mean, this four steps to rebuild your parents trust after they catch you in a lie. This is great stuff. You know, it's funny. It's all the stuff that youth have told us that they want and that they don't get in the educational system. Right. Because it's focused on like a very rigid curriculum. And what people need often are basic skills that you don't learn in school. Right. Like there's stuff on there. How do credit scores work? Right. It has a mortgage work. That may sound really simple, but like people aren't taught that in school and they're like the biggest financial decisions you're going to make in your life. I mean, I remember the first year of university applying for every single credit card I could get and, and actually getting a bunch of them and being like, wow. And I like no idea. And all of a sudden you're yeah. a university student. You find I mean, if, if you're three or four or five thousand dollars in credit card debt as a student, you're in big trouble. But it's and, and, and ultimately not about assigning blame. I don't want to get down a rabbit hole here. It's your fault technically. But at the same time. Why do we why do we talk to kids about quadratic equations and all the other things that I've forgotten and not talk to them about compounding interest and, and payday loans and all of the things that are actually relevant and could be really problematic? I think that this touch I mean, this hits the nail on the head. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, check it out. There's a lot. Of, there's, the dog meme you reference is used in at least one. We call them bites, all the micro learning courses. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of animated GIFs, bites and all that, you know, just added the experience. Right. The more engaging it is, it's like watching, you know, the news. And if, you know, sometimes boring, but if you watch, I don't know, John Oliver or something, it makes it more entertaining. Same type of thing. Right. If you can make it engaging and entertaining, you make it in the sort of language that people want to speak. And on the topics that they really care about and aren't getting taught, then there's some value to be created. And, you know, our whole thing is that you know, we're a nonprofit, right? So that allows us to get people to create content for it, like Wikipedia, because they know that it's all going to create social value. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's all mobile first, right? So, you know, hopefully if you, if you find some time, next time you're trying to load Instagram and, and you know, or whatever, maybe not TikTok, but, you know, maybe check out a bite instead and, uh, you know, Maybe maybe share with people and see, you know, might, might find some cool stuff. My favorite bite on there for what it's worth is one on the benefits of handwriting. 
which is something I didn't know, but there's all this research that says that if you take handwritten notes, you remember it better and other things. And I had, I had, I'll say I'll switch to digital fully and now I'll switch back to notebooks. So. I love it. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. I, I'm I, yeah. This is I'm going to spend all afternoon on this. Um, Rumi dot org is where people can find it. R U M I E dot org. We've been talking to the CEO uh, Tarek Fancy, who, by the way, you you might have the coolest Twitter handle I've seen in a long time. So so fancy. Which is <laughs> did did you manage to get the same one on TikTok? Is that where people can find you there as well? I think it's so so fancy zero seven or something. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I first looked for fancy, it was gone. I looked for so fancy, it was gone. <laughs> so I had to become so so, so fancy. But it worked on a few places, so there you have it. Well, listen, ever since I read, uh, I, I mean, I, I was reading about you in The Economist, uh, that, that Globe editorial I'd read a while ago, and I've really been looking forward to connecting with you for a long time. I want to thank you for, for giving us your time, your expertise here on Real Talk. Um, I know people have been enjoying it live, and then when this podcast drops uh, this afternoon, I know we're going to see a lot of chatter about this. Uh, really appreciate this, Tark, and thanks. Wishing you continued success. My pleasure. It's great, great being on. Thanks, thanks for the time. You bet. That's Tark Fancy joining us. Uh, used to be the head of sustainability at BlackRock. It's the world's biggest asset manager. They managed nine trillion dollars. He walked away from that gig um, and is now doing incredible work at Rumi at Rumi dot org. Uh, just a fantastic conversation. Before we get into some of your comments and, and and touch on some of the other stories we're following today, I wanted to remind you that the team at Local Waste presents. Trash Talk every Friday right here on the show. It's your chance to blow off a little steam, get something off your chest. We're getting a ton about politics. We're getting a ton of submissions to talk at ryanjesperson.com about rodeo. I'd like to challenge a few of you to, to, to reinvent to reinvent the Trash Talk submission, to take a different angle. Let's infuse a little humor into it. Let's have a little fun. It don't all have to be fun, but Local Waste loves talking trash. You know that. You can find them online at localwaste.ca. When it comes to how they've approached COVID-19 and the pandemic, they've, they've been meeting with customers virtually or outdoors. They can come to your business, check out your parking lot. You know where your bins might be for your waste collection. They say we see COVID as a challenge to be better, not an excuse to do less at localwaste.ca. Real Talk is very proud to be presenting the Global Visions film series at this year's Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival. Now, it may not be going down at the Metro Cinema at the Garneau in Edmonton per usual, but the show is going on. They've got an outstanding lineup of some of this year's best documentaries all available online. 40 feature films, 40 short films available for viewing to anybody from May 6th through the 16th. This is your chance to scream some of the hottest new docs from Canada and abroad, many of them even world premieres. We're going to be talking to a couple of the filmmakers. We're going to be talking to a couple of the stars, the features of some of these docs in the weeks to come. As a matter of fact, over the next few days, but we wanted to remind you that you can find them online right now at northwestfest.ca. And by the way, if you're a Patreon supporter of Real Talk, first of all, thank you. Second of all, you're going to see some exclusive benefits, exclusive access to Northwest Fest in the next Sunday message that we email you. Also wanted to remind you that the team at Westworld is ready to pump up your workouts and your backyard barbecue season with the sounds of spring. You know, they carry Sonos, that whole home Wi-Fi audio system. They've got the portable speakers there. This is how you can enjoy your music. Music, your voice control, your multi-room listening using Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth streaming and all-day battery life with waterproof durability. What more could you ask for for music on the go this summer? You'll also find brands like Beats, Ultimate Ears, and JBL at Westworld Computers online at westworld.ca. I don't know who to start with first because uh, Sarah Hoyle is the producer of this show. Samuel Brooks, our technical producer. Both of you, just like me, I'm literally on the edge of my seat talking to Tarek Fancy. That was fantastic stuff. Uh, it it would take real. Can, I mean, it's it's amazing to hear a guy talk about an opportunity. You've got this this executive job at. I mean, we talk about investing. An asset manager's BlackRock is it. I mean that that that's like if you're working in in you know I mean whatever I don't need to start naming industries but that is that is when the CEO of BlackRock says something it it it, it reverberates it's like Warren Buffett saying it reverberates through mm, the yeah. entire industry uh, a man of conviction and great insight I thought that was fantastic I mean when you look at the job that he signed on to at BlackRock he was saying yeah I, I like this is an incredible opportunity for me to be able to 
be in this the largest investment um, organization. So of course, yeah, I want to take it. So to then step away from it, I mean, he obviously was a man of conviction before he went in and thinking that he could really make a difference. I mean, I'm assuming, but I'm I'm thinking that, yeah, it, it would probably seem like a really great opportunity. And then when it didn't, you know, he, and I love it now he's at a nonprofit. Yeah. <laughs> From BlackRock to a nonprofit, and not because he took some CEO payout for you know some golden parachute for ninety five million dollars. Sam, your, it was your question. It was the one that you wanted to ask about election cycles, which I thought was really great because you can you can talk about. It. And I thought his 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 statistics on the average American CEO was amazing. What did he say? Income like salary three hundred twenty times. Didn't he say yeah, the average of, worker? Of whoever's at the base of the company. But yeah. but the shelf life relatively quick and people serve their self-interest and the best short-term interest of the company. You were the one that wanted to talk about election cycles. Well, I think that, you know, to me, I, I and, and you brought it up wonderfully and I actually think Tarek answered it incredibly well too, is that like, you know, we need leaders with visions beyond four years. And I think that that's part of the problem is that, you know, the moment he said that the average CEO lasts four to five years, I was just like, well, that's the time that the average politician cycles themselves on and and you can see really quickly why no meaningfully meaningful policy changes happen because uh you know politicians think short term they are lobbied by big business who is also thinking short term and when the rubber hits the road and somebody needs to pass a regulation they're thinking of getting reelected over uh you know actually doing some great good you know in in an unbelievably microcosm right now i'm oddly kind of excited about Biden. And I say that because, you know, politicians are going to politician uh, to to borrow a phrase from politic, uh, yeah. from from Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. I can't uh, I can't claim that phrase. Politicians are going to politician. He said he wants to be a one term president. And so far, he's acting like it. So far, he's putting big, bold things on the table because he doesn't care about getting reelected. In theory, I mean, whether we see Biden going for a second term or trying to like you know massage this into somebody else for the Democratic Party, yeah, I think you'd like to see. see the, yeah. I think you'd like to see the Democrats win again, but maybe oh, not yeah, him for sure. Maybe not him. But I also like. I mean, I'm curious, you guys' take on it. Do you think that actually gives him more license to take a long vision when so many people would just refuse to do it? Well, when we, I mean, you you see that from politicians at every level, and and I actually think it's it it it's sometimes kind of exciting. Um, whether it's a mayor or, or or a premier or a prime minister or an American president or whatever the case may be, someone that says, I'm, I'm not seeking reelection. This is my final term. And that's when you go, ooh, this last year is going to be one to watch. Yeah. Right. This yeah. is this last year is going to be the one to watch. But if but if you if you want to talk about localizing conversations about this type of thing and election cycles and politicians worrying about their own career prospects and, and, and also what's good for their party longer term, it's why we don't have meaningful conversations about things like I mean, it depends on where you're tuning in from, where you're listening to the show from. But if you're in Alberta, it's why we don't have meaningful conversations about a sales tax. It's why federally speaking, we, we probably have not had really meaningful conversations about things like like electoral reform mm -hmm. or or decriminalizing or legalizing all narcotics or universal basic income or some of the other things. Um, and then we could probably take jurisdictions around the world and find other examples. But that is the I mean, people, you know, in Alberta, everybody knows, you know, you refer to the PST as a political suicide tax. It's just assumed that the politician that would ever uh, in in invoke, uh, you know, the ability or the power to legislate that type of thing would essentially be driving a nail into the coffin of their own political career, which, which quite frankly is ridiculous because it doesn't serve. I'm not saying you know implement impose a PST or not. I mean, I am saying impose a PST, but but the premise is it stops even the exploration of the idea, which I, which hurts the public. Yes, but I think it cuts both ways because you look at you know having limited term. If we eliminate or extend a term. We're looking, I mean, look at Putin. How many times has he been like, you know, I'd like one more kick yeah, at the Yeah, but can. I don't think we get, like when he talked about China, you can't talk about China well, no, or Russia yeah. and compare it to elections. I mean, does anybody even believe those elections? No. No, but but I think, and I'm not saying that we're going to slide into that kind of uh, governing system if we extend terms, but I, I think it, you know, I... I can see an argument for, for both ways. One is, you know, accountability. So if someone's not doing something, if we're feeling kind of uh, left out there without any true leadership, then, you know, we can vote somebody out versus if they're in for a long time, then they can actually do, 
you know, long-term have long-term vision. So I, I think it cuts both ways. And, um, and it, I mean, if, if I'm liking what they're doing, sure. I'd love them to stick around, but what if, <laughs> what if I'm not like a huge fan yeah. and I'm like, eh, I'd like you to, there's the door. Yeah. A buddy of mine, uh, Jared Campbell, who's, who's appeared on our, uh, we, we call it the group chat round table. We've got, we've got this group chat where people from different political persuasions gather and discuss things off the record, uh, through the day. And, and uh, he, he's calling me out for being somewhat disingenuous in my demands for public consultation on issues. He says, you only want public consultations on the issues where you disagree where the mm. government's going. And I said, yes, I'm glad you finally understand. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> I, I do not desire or require a government to consult me on things that I have programs that I already agree with. That's good. You keep those up. And the ones that I have a problem with, you must demand consultation. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's just the way it goes. Um, he, you know, and then I had to remind him, all the world's a stage. If politicians are going to politic, I mean, that's just one way that that manifests itself. Um, I want to get into our uh, what we heard from Alberta's premier yesterday, Jason Kenney, because there was, there was an interesting follow. I mean, all of this Mon- Monday show was all about the rodeo in Bowdoin. Right. And but there were other uh, uh, stories uh, going on. Bowdoin. Did you see the the mayor say no, 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 Mayor's no, 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 choked no. about it. Yeah. Big are, time. Yeah. We are not in Bowdoin. This did not happen. in The Bowdoin. rodeo near Bowdoin, yes. which they would which they would. That's and, and actually that's a fair point because the mayor of Bowdoin was pretty ticked off about this. Um, so the rodeo near Bowdoin is Thank what we were you. talking about yesterday. Uh, Jason Kenny, uh, and, and we're going to see uh, further restrictions. We expect announced fr- from the Alberta government today. Uh, what those will be, we don't know. Uh, as as Alberta's numbers double those in Ontario, I, I didn't really want to dig in with Tarek Fancy on that. Um, he's like Ontario's a mess. I was like, bud, <laughs> if Ontario's a mess, I don't know what you're going to call it over here. And it's not funny. Uh, our numbers are off the charts. Our ICU admissions are the highest they've ever been in 14 months uh, through the course of this, and and hospitalizations are, are trending in a very concerning direction. The healthcare system is strained. Uh, you need only talk to any healthcare professional. We've been getting emails from a bunch of them, and so I think on the heels of you know hundreds, if not thousands, of people gathering at this rodeo. Over the weekend, people expected uh, Jason Kenney probably to address it directly. Now, he, he did talk about how he was saddened and angered by it, which is what he said uh, after the second day of, of the rodeo had wrapped up. But reporters had a chance yesterday to actually ask a few questions. Now, I will say of my fellow reporters, I was disappointed that nobody directly asked the premier why the rodeo was not stopped, why fines were not handed out, and why his promise to enforce the law was not taken seriously. I have no idea why no journalist asked him that question, but they did ask some good ones. And so let's get to a few here. This first one, uh, the voice you're going to hear is Jeff Slack, who's a journalist with 660 News out of Calgary. This his question, and it's just going to be a quick one for Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney, this is yesterday afternoon. Now, with all due respect, at this stage, why should Albertans have faith in your leadership to guide us out of this third wave when your government essentially got us to this point right now? Well, the virus got us to this point right now. Um, I One of the things I find regrettable about COVID from day one is this tendency to try to politicize it and turn it into a blame game. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> One of the things that Jason Kenney finds regrettable about this pandemic is the tendency to politicize it and try to turn it into a blame game. I mean, that is unbelievable. I got an amazing tweet uh, just a short time before we went on the air, and and I wanted to share this with you. This from (laughs) Golden Rule Nana. Golden Rule Nana, who tweets from Raging Lib Nana. And and I checked out the profile. I I said, I got to find out if this person's real. She says, I'm uh, 73 years of age. Love my grandkids, LGBTQ friendly, and sometimes I post recipes. That was raging lib nana. <laughs> but here, look for it. But here's account. what her tweet had to say. She says, "If COVID nineteen were STDs, conservative premiers would be demanding get us condoms." The prime minister would say, "Okay, well here they are." Conservative premiers would say, "Okay, well now we cut open the end so we can still feel something, and if we get an STD, it's Trudeau's fault." And I thought that that was a pretty bang on tweet from Raging Lib Nana. As a matter of fact, I'm going to bestow upon you the honor of tweet of the day, even though it's early. Even though we've not even hit noon live here as we broadcast the show. So Jason Kenney says he finds the the, the blame game and the politicization of of COVID-19 regrettable, which is amazing. Um, I do agree with him. It is very regrettable. 
James Keller was up next in the queue asking questions. Uh, he's a journalist at The Globe and Mail. Here he is. Health measure experts were uh, warning of this coming wave a few weeks ago. I mean, pretty much exactly what they described is coming to pass. So when I mean, you talk about the blame game, Alberta has the exact same access to vaccines, the same ability to put in policy measures. I know there's differences between provinces, but of course, we would respond with to the local scenarios. So you're talking about responding to the numbers, but it seems like you haven't been. So I'm just wondering, how can you not shoulder some blame for things getting this out of hand? You could have acted earlier, but you didn't. Uh, again, I, I reject the premise of that, day, uh, J, uh, Jason. Sorry, James, we have been acting, as I've said. Um, I know that I find it peculiar that some of the media commentary suggests that Alberta has had a little or no restrictions. Again, it has been effectively illegal for people, for grandparents to visit their grandchildren in this province for half a year. I saw somebody respond to that live on Twitter yesterday by saying, excuse me, Mr. Premier, I reject the premise of you rejecting the premise. So James Keller went on and, and followed up and we started getting some insight into how the premier feels about actually enforcing public health measures. And, and here it is, the message from the top. From the beginning, that our approach has not been to impose uh, indiscriminate uh, restrictions on every facet of society that could only fray, further fray uh, compliance. I've made this point repeatedly that what matters is not the stringency of restrictions, but compliance with them. And if, if you have a, a compliance problem, as apparently we do here in Alberta, uh, hammering people relentlessly with uh, ever more stringent restrictions is not necessarily the optimal approach. So Carrie Tate of the Globe and Mail follows up on that and and, and kind of goes, well, as a matter of fact, Carrie can say it in her own words. Here she is. Premier, I'm a bit confused, I think, like a lot of my colleagues. I'm wondering, why do you keep taking these piecemeal steps? I understand that you don't want these wholesale restrictions. You value lives and livelihoods. But it seems like there's just these bit by bit steps and it's not having any cumulative effect. What's holding you back from doing the types of things that you're talking about doing tomorrow as one big package and fighting this with a full fight? Well, uh, again, I, I, th I think that question and some others uh, understate the degree, the stringency of public health restrictions we've had in Alberta for a very long time. I'll repeat to you that uh, we can have on paper a uh, the hardest lockdown imaginable and if a critical percentage of the population a large share of the population isn't following that it doesn't matter and uh, it's it's i think it's pretty clear that with a public health policy very similar to our neighboring provinces with growing numbers in alberta but shrinking numbers in bc and saskatchewan that there is a behavioral difference here and that is something that we have to take into account in all of the decisions that we make. Uh, and so uh, what we want is, is for folks to follow the rules, not rules for the sake of rules. Uh, and uh, so we have, uh, th that's why we've always taken the approach that restrictions should be a last and limited resort to maximize compliance and public buy-in. Try to wrap your mind around that, right? We... We've always believed that having virtually no rules is the best way to get people to follow the virtually no rules that we have. That's the premise of it. What's the difference? We've had virtually the same restrictions, says the premier, in B.C. and Alberta and Saskatchewan. There seems to be this problem with noncompliance in Alberta. When I Google B.C. COVID-19 enforcement, I get... News story after news story after news story of hundreds of tickets handed out to people that are that are violating COVID-19 rules. I saw that nine people over the weekend were, were cited for tickets $2,000 a piece. You can talk all you want. The, the premier talking a few days ago about how Alberta's really going to crack down. Sam, I'm putting you on the spot. This was a video from a few days ago. Do we still have that where, where Jason Kenny was? It was from April 29th. Uh, I played it on the show yesterday. We don't have it. It doesn't matter. April 29th, if you want to look it up, um, it's about six and a half minutes, if I remember off the top of my head, off the file. You can find it at alberta.ca. You click on news. You can go back through the archives, the YouTube archives of those news availabilities. He says we're going to crack down. 
says we're going to issue fines. And he says, and you're going to have to pay those fines. You're going to have to pay them or you're not going to be able to renew your driver's license. So you'll be driving suspended and and violate even further fines or you're going to have to pay your COVID-19 fines. And then a rodeo happens with about 2,000 people. And hundreds of people gather in in a legal church service in, in Parkland County, west of Edmonton, on private property. Look at this, what we're seeing right now. For those of you that are watching this on YouTube, I mean, this is a photo taken, posted on Twitter uh, from, from Kathy Lee with CTV. This is that, I mean, this, this is not like, I mean, th- 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 these are packed bleachers, packed, nobody wearing masks. Alberta's going to crack down. We're going to hand out fines. You're going to have to pay them. Really? Maybe tomorrow. Yeah, maybe, tomorrow. Maybe starting tomorrow. Not at the rodeo with 2,000 people, which was two days after the premier talked tough. But we're having a hard time finding out why there's a problem with noncompliance in Alberta. We can't quite put our finger on why. You know? It's like we have speed limits. We have limits on or legislation around impaired driving. But if you don't have any law enforcement... People are going to speed and people are going to drive impaired. It's the way that it goes. You can have building codes, but if you don't ever have building inspectors, you're going to have people cutting corners. I've got all day to talk about education versus enforcement, but every once in a while you got to enforce. Can you imagine if a check stop's only role was to educate people on the damage they might be doing by driving high and drunk? Yesterday, Tyler sent me an email about 9.30 at night. I imagine Tyler's day was winding down and he was finally able to sit down, hit up talk at ryanjesperson.com. He said, thank you for your passionate rant on the rodeo. It made me tear up, says Tyler. It's been a really tough year, especially the last six months. Tyler says, I almost lost my partner this Christmas due to mental illness, which has manifested aggressively during the last few months. Seemingly caused by lack of contact with our friends and family. I remember her looking at me and having no emotion in her eyes. And it was one of the scariest things I will ever experience. Luckily, she's doing better, but it hurts both of us deeply to know that we're following the rules, trying to bend the curve. And meanwhile, these garbage humans are out there flouting. Why can Albertans not see the way out of this is through staying at home, following health guidelines. I mean, as Albertans are we that selfish that we can't even handle the tiniest amount of sacrifice. I watched the video of the the rodeo organizer. It's it's on Facebook. He speaks for about eight minutes. And he says, you know, we haven't been able to rodeo for a year and a half. Boo hoo. Well, I mean, I don't want to take anything away from the rodeo. But like a lot of people haven't been able to do a lot of things for a year and a half. You know, if you want to talk about the impact on the guy goes, rodeos our business. It's how we make our living. No shit, dude. Like the way that everybody makes their living has been interrupted. People haven't been able to see their grandkids. People haven't been able to see their dying parents. I just we haven't been able to rodeo for a year and a half. I mean, I haven't been able to scuba dive for a year and a half, but I'm not going to go out there and start complaining publicly about it. I don't lack that self-awareness. Right. But I I really, truly feel like this is what Kenny's talking about is the fact that, you know, like people aren't following the rules. If there was swift and exacting um, enforcement right off the hop, we wouldn't be in this place and we wouldn't be being pitted against each other. Like we wouldn't be having to say, like, why is this person doing that? Why is that person doing that? It would be. It would just be equal and fair across the board. I know I keep using the drunk driving example, but it's like if your if your neighbor, if every morning you woke up and the neighbor's car was parked on the front lawn with with like the driver's door open and like the coffee mug on the ground and they'd clearly come home wasted and just about you know run over their geraniums. Can you imagine if morning after morning all you could say was I just it just drives me crazy. Like why why is he always driving? Just drives me crazy. Why can't we all get on board? What would you do? I mean, you'd call the police. You'd file a report. There'd be some way to enforce it. And right now, I wouldn't blame people for feeling like Tyler does. He goes on and he goes, say, Alberta's burning. Like, people are dying. But the rodeo goes on. The government stands by, avoiding any meaningful action. Says a lot, says Tyler, about who Albertans really are. Now, I want to take issue with that last bit. Just like Rachel Notley did yesterday. I don't think that's who Albertans really are. I think that's who some Albertans really are. I know people are going to, I'm going to get a hashtag. Well, Jesperson, not all Albertans. That's what I'm going to get ripped for it. 
But I believe that this province is, is, is full of compassionate people that do get on board. I've seen it. When, when Fort McMurray was burning, we ended up, we had a sponsor that was providing us tractor trailers to get supplies to where they needed to be. Things like bottles of water and, and diapers. And I talked about it on my radio show. We ended up filling seven tractor trailers, seven with donations from people. That's Alberta. Alberta is when half the province is underwater, flooding, people step up. Alberta is people, I'll never forget, I mean, this was five years ago yesterday. I mean, five years ago today was the immediate aftermath. I mean, it was still in progress. Fort McMurray was still fully on fire five years ago today. And I remember, I'll never forget hosting that radio show. It was on, it, it was on uh, by the way, May the 4th be with everybody. Uh, it, was on, it was on May 4th, five years ago, uh, May 3rd into the 4th, where, where my radio show at that time became like a, like, a, like a bulletin board. Like people calling in, we had, we, we, I used to have a screen in front of me that could take 12 calls at a time, and all 12 slots were full. And as soon as I'd take one call and hang up, it would fill again because people were calling in. And we were doing what, what otherwise on any other day would be terrible radio. Boring, weird. Ter- have you ever heard of Tradio? They do it in small towns. Have you guys heard of Tam? Have you heard of Tradio? Yeah, I, say, I think Sonic tries to do that some every once in a while. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. It, it's Tradio is really cool. It's like I a don't small. Know, I the radio show to say I want to sell a lawnmower. It, yes, or trade. Yeah. yeah, I want to trade a yeah, lawnmower. So it's like I want to trade a lawnmower. What What do you give me? And yeah. it's like a, it's a show. And then people call in and they're like, I'll give you a park bench or, or, or I'll give you whatever. And, yeah. and they trade and it's amazing. So we were kind of doing Tradio, and not really, but people were calling in to say I've got five acres with water. I can take horses. Wow. You need to store your snowmobiles. I've got a Quonset that locks. Here's my, we were putting out addresses. I was giving out people's phone numbers. It was three hours straight of people calling in to say, we have spare rooms in our house. We can take dogs and cats. We can, I've never, I'm getting chills right now as I'm talking about it. That was five years ago yesterday. But that is Alberta. Like, let me be clear. But here's something else that happened during the Fort McMurray fires because leadership matters. Then Premier Rachel Notley and then opposition leader Brian Jean like had no politics between them solving the crisis. They put everything aside and they went to work. Or at least they convinced us that that's what was happening. Right? At least there was that sort of collective understanding. That's what Brian Jean, I I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm going to say the words I was going to say, even though it might be misinterpreted. I don't mean it that way. But Brian Jean became human to a lot of people through the course of that tragedy that hadn't like Brian Jean's life blew up. He lost his son to tragic illness. His house burned to the ground. I mean, the guy just was taken one. And there he is. And who's going to forget the image of Brian Jean wearing rubber boots, sleeping in a tent, or at least he had a tent set up there. I mean, that, that was like when a lot of people were kind of like, this is, I mean, you see the human side of a politician, and and to a certain degree, it, it, it changes people's perspective. I think Brian Jean, we've been trying to get him on the show. He's, he's, I'll tell you right now, he's cooking something up. I don't know what it is, and I'm trying to find out. And he's awesome. He always gets back to me, and he's so polite, and he's always like, just not, not now, not yet. We'll see. We'll we'll talk, you know, kind of thing. I'm like, what are you cooking up? What are you working on? I just, when you say, you know, it's not all Albertans, I say it's, oh, I truly don't think it's Albertan at all. And I, I, I truly think that the folks that were at the rodeo, they are, oh, they're feeling single, like, because the rules have not been across the board applied fairly and certain people have been allowed to get away with certain things that um, it's, yeah, it's, it's felt like it, it's not a fair playing field. So people are feeling persecuted and prosecuted, rightly so or wrongly so. If rules had been fair, there wouldn't be the haves and the have nots. There wouldn't, it wouldn't have pitted Albertans against Albertans. So to me, I like, no, I do not condone what happened at the rodeo. But I, I see the frustration and, like, why they're saying what they're saying. I don't think it's right. But the frustration and feeling like they've been alienated for God knows how long, um, seeing that there's, you know, rural crime is way up and jobs are going elsewhere. Like, so to me, I understand that alienation. <sighs> 
And it's only been stoked. It's only been encouraged because there's been an unfair application of rules and enforcement. There's a, an email that we got from Angry Adam that's really good. Actually, he touches on a comment that you made yesterday. I want to get to that in just a second. But first, I want to remind you that the team at Eden Landscaping, I had a chance to talk to, to Michael, who's who's owned that company for more than 20 years. He and I had a Zoom last night. Um, we can't wait to get together and crush a couple of cold ones in the backyard. But it, it's Zoom for now, and that's how he's been meeting with his clients. And I asked him, how are things going? And he his face told it all. He goes, well it's not easy he goes in landscape construction you can run into issues and you can run into problems and run into challenges and then he kind of like looks right at and he goes but i'll tell you what he goes we're proud that he goes you you check us out he says you talk to our past clients and customers he says you look at online reviews you look at what people say about us he says we leave every customer satisfied he says we are in the problem solving business i said okay michael well tomorrow on the show i'm going to tell everybody that at landscapeedmonton.ca they can put their their gnarliest landscaping challenges whether it's flooding or drainage or that 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 sod that just won't survive I'm going to tell him that you can solve it. He goes, yeah, you go right ahead. And so at landscapeedmonton.ca right now, you're going to find more evidence on why Eden Landscaping has the most satisfied customers in Alberta. Also a reminder that, hey, uh, Sarah gets looped into this now. Both of us feeding our dogs with Grand Dog Essentials, the quality raw food that pays off in spades. I can tell you our dogs, Moses and Moreau, their guts can get a little bit off. And Grand Dog has solved the problem for us with both of them. Customized nutritious solutions including some great options on supplements check them out online today at granddog.ca and make sure you use the promo code real talk for 10 percent off your first order you look like you want to say something i need to on behalf of ranger my dog yeah he loves his food so much that he actually went and sat in the box that it comes in <laughs> wow, because the cats were trying to get into the box and he was like oh hell no staking his claim this is my box of you, my food you mean the box that they deliver right to your door right in to my calgary door. edmonton <laughs> or central alberta you that see how one, we can do yeah. this sarah oh we're only going to get better at this as time goes on <laughs> also a reminder that the team at alta moving and storage is so proud to be alberta owned and operating in the province of alberta customer satisfaction is number one with alta moving and storage just like you they have families and friends that depend on them and when it comes to moving they're the ones that are trustworthy dependable and knowledgeable devising moving solutions that fit your unique situation and budget it's the time of year where people are going to move make alta moving and storage at altastorage.ca your choice and you make sure you let them know that you heard about them on real talk talk at ryanjesperson.com is where we get our emails i just looked at the time this is uh <laughs> I just went, whoa, whoa. I had no idea. We've just been having great conversations on the show today. We can't apologize for that. Angry Adam said, you know, guys, Monday's show was a remarkable one and one that provoked a lot of thought. There was one specific portion that kept persistently forcing its way to the front of my thoughts. Sarah uh, made an eloquent point that, that I wonder if it maybe went unnoticed with some audience members. He said, I can relate to the tendency of stopping short of saying what you want to say because you know that it may have an adverse effect. But in reality, it was the closest I've ever seen anyone come to actually describing the very real and very serious scenario we find ourselves in. Making noise and writing letters is obviously important, but that only works in a democratic society. You know what he's getting at. He's getting at your comment yesterday, your lamentation of what do we do? What can we do? Angry Adam says, like everything in life, if you don't care for something, it'll leave you. And democracy is no different. And unfortunately, neglect has ruptured a gaping hole in what we once thought to be unsinkable. He says, of course, things have to start somewhere, but that thing was already started. And it may have been enough in recent times. We have to start coming to grips with the reality of what is actually occurring in front of us. There is a dark, ominous beast rising, and it's well beyond the stage of being tameable by traditional means. I love how this guy writes in which we are still ignorantly, you know, we feel that we're capable of these tasks. He, he, he wraps up his email, does Angry Adam, by quoting the great Canadian author Margaret Atwood. Ignoring is not the same as ignorance. You have to work at it. Adam says, I just hope it hasn't already come to that. I mean, it's going back to the interview with uh, Tarek, just talking about how, um, you know, economic insecurity, um, economic uh, divisions and disparity is the word I was looking for. Disparity um, is is undermining democracy. So I don't, I just felt like the whole show came full circle on 
on the topics yeah. and, wh- and where we are in the COVID pandemic. Um, I love this from Blind Mel and totally unrelated, but I have, it says, I just booked Alta Moving and Storage for my upcoming move. Well done, Blind Melon, and good luck on the move. Have you, are you a move? I'm the, I, I'm like, I would, I would do anything to, other avoid. Than, uh, to avoid moving. <laughs> I would do anything to avoid moving. Moving is the worst. The worst. The absolute worst. And then I'm always like, why do I have so much stuff? Like, I gotta, what am I doing with my life? Why do I have so much stuff? So yes, moving company. I did it for the first time, my most recent move. And I was like, oh, I am never going back. Yeah. Never. I know. I'm just that's what I'm, I'm turning this back into a spot unintentionally. But it, like for them, when they're like, they that's what they're we like, do around. Yeah, here. they're like, we have the pod style moving containers. We have the, the we can provide the labor, all this. And I'm like, and and all I need people to I, I, like my idea. Next time we move, I'm going to Maui or something. I mean, I'm not actually this is just my dream. This isn't reality. Um, and I'm just going to hand them the keys. And, and it's like the house. Maybe the dishes aren't even done. The garbage might not even be emptied. And I'm just like, whatever it's going to be, you can just pack everything up, move it, and unpack it in the new place. And then and then we'll just take the Uber from the airport to the new house and walk in and go straight to bed. That's my ideal circumstance. Uh, ideally with nothing broken. That, that would that would be the ideal circumstance. Um, we, we've got a whole bunch uh, going on uh, coming up for tomorrow's show. and wanted to uh, remind you before we wrap today's show that we do have our question of the week up right now at ryanjesperson.com. We'll get into the results of, of last week's questions, some really interesting ones. Uh, hundreds of you responded, but we want to get this one officially launched and off the ground. Um, we endeavor to have about a thousand of you chime in. So we've got a great sample size every week in partnership with Y Station, our official research and strategy partner. We're taking on dark money in politics. We'll be talking more about this as we ease into the summer and then into the fall. Municipal elections are going to become more of a focus. Uh, with elections, Alberta's most recently quarter raising uh, or the, the quarterly fundraising reports here in Alberta, uh, the NDP raised about one point two million dollars uh, out raising the United Conservatives two to one. However, in a similar period, the federal Conservative Party of Canada broke a party record, bringing in eight and a half million dollars out raising the federal Liberal Party. There's been talk, of course, keep in mind, of a federal election coming soon. So we ask you, does money really matter that much? What drives you to make political donations? How do you expect your donations to be used? We want to know about your perspective on political donations, what drives you, and what you think about dark money. It'll take you about three minutes to fill it all out, and we thank you in advance. Again, that's our question of the week at ryanjesperson.com, presented by the team at Y Station. Before we let you go, I also want to remind you of a few things. You have to pay somebody for internet, electricity, and natural gas. You're going to run it into your home no matter what, at least most of you. So why not take your business to a business that gives back to the communities where they live? live and work. That's what Park Power does with their 10% commitment. Profits going back to nonprofits. It's all part of their corporate philosophy. You can read more about that at parkpower.ca. And while you're there, consider signing up. If you bring your business over and use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you $70 off your first bill. No strings attached at parkpower.ca. Also wanted to give a big shout out to the teams at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. I love how they kept it real. I was telling you a conversation I had with Scott Held, their principal there, Held Automotive Group, that owns the two dealerships. He said to me, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, selection is slim. He says, you don't have to tell that. He says, Ryan, you're not going to have to tell people that are shopping for Ram trucks right now. They already know it. Uh, There's a lot of contributing factors here. What they're excited about is, number one, they have access to the best inventory in the province. Number two, they've got the two dealerships so they can share their inventory. You're not going to find better selection than you will at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, home of the three-time Motor Trend winning truck of the year, the famous Ram. And also a big shout out to our friends at Dairy Queen of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. With apologies, if you're visiting a Dairy Queen in Vancouver or a Dairy Queen in Winnipeg or Ottawa or even Calgary, for that matter, you are not going to get the special perks, the special deals that you will at the six Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, where all the way through till this weekend, if you drop my name, Jespo, or mention Real Talk, they're going to give you $5 off a Mother's Day cake. Uh Uh-huh. 
five bucks off. Plus, starting on Friday, May the 7th, their locations will also be giving out a carnation with the purchase of a Mother's Day cake. These are the ones with vanilla soft serve, chocolate soft serve, their famous cookie and fudge center. You can call the store to special order or you can pop by to pick up one from their inventory. Make sure you drop my name or Real Talk. They'll give you five bucks off. And there we have it. It's two and a half hours in. And we've got work to do off air. It's been a show. It's been a show. We've not solved all the world's problems. We opened the can of fighting in hockey and then walked away. I noticed that real talkers weren't necessarily done with it, which leads me to believe that maybe there's a segment to be had there. Sarah Hoyle's interest is peaked, I can tell. We're going to get to work now off air. We know you've got a day to get to. We'll meet you here again live tomorrow morning, real talkers. Thanks for being a part of this. We'll see you soon.